Okay, let's see what's going on. Ba da 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 da. Hello, everyone. How are we doing? Now, I've been having a very interesting day, and currently, I've been looking a little bit more interesting because I have a fluffy research assistant down there. You can't see it, but just up above my head is his dinner. And about every five minutes he goes, can I have my dinner? And he can't have his dinner until he's been back from his walk for at least 40 minutes. Which is actually right about now. So I'm going to, I, I wanted to start on time, but uh, if you don't mind, I'm going to take a couple of seconds to give a very deserving fluffy dog his tea. Not sure that about it, but you know, I hope. There we go. You going to eat it? You are going to eat it. Oh, you are happy with eating it. You're wagging your tail. That's good. You happy to have it? Would you like it raised up? You would. You'd like it raised up. Okay, let me get you something to raise it up on because I know you are a a, a, a fluff of distinction. I won't call. You, I won't say what comes next. Ah, there you go. Right. How's that? Can I put it on that? Does it make you happier? That good? That helps the gesture a bit. That's good. All right. Now that that's been dealt with, what are we gonna? Oh, you want padded? Is it blocking something for you? Blocking your access to Papa? Oh, it's blocking your access to Papa. Okay. There we go. Ah, oh, now we're happy. Now we're wagging tail. Right then. <sighs> Sorry about that, everyone. Right, let's change the settings to... Well, it's going to have to be about... 480. Hmm. Yeah, about. So. Hello, Bijan, you've reached six months uh, today as a um, subscriber, as a member for six months, so thank you. Thank you for uh, congratulations. Uh, definitely congratulations on my book. Thank you. But thank you for being a subscriber for six months. As you can see, these are all the copies I have left. And they are all assigned to family members and people, and books are going off, etc. There are part of there are boxes arriving, and they're being dispatched around the world. But hopefully, if enough books are ordered from uh, from from Pen and Sword, if enough sales go through, then well, I get some more sent to me, and eventually, if I get enough sent to me, I'll make some prizes for competitions. Hello, Peter Dawson. Hello, Night Six Everyone. Hello, Abazaski. Hello, Ubisava. Hello, Carl Gasberg. Hello, Right Sublet. Hello. Hello. Ooh. Hello, 35 Benvids. Interesting chat going on there. Hello, Sean V. How are you doing? Hello, Jonathan Burrow. Hello, John South. Hello, Seneca Nero. Ooh. Uh, Night 6 everyone. The Italian battleships does become an interesting conversation because it could get even worse than you think it could. Uh, Jonathan Burrow, Aquila has started early in response. No, the, the, uh, the Royal Navy has carriers the whole way through World War II in the Mediterranean. The Italians don't start Aquila because of their own internal arguments and their own internal fighting. She's not going to get started early, even if the Royal Navy has more carriers, because they don't see a carrier carrier fight as necessary. They, they, they don't see a carrier as necessary to fighting another carrier. They see a carrier as necessary to protecting your task group against land attack. Yes, it's HMS Argentcore is the new emoji. It is HMS Argentcore. Clever boy, you really do take after your papa. You've eaten all the chicken and left all the supposedly healthy stuff. Good boy. Yeah, sorry. 
Had to compliment the fluffy research assistant on that one. Don't tell you either. Go on. <sighs> I can't see HMS Courageous, Glorious, and Furious going to Pacific. Um, I doubt they get to the Pacific Fleet, but you never know about the Eastern Fleet. Um, hello, Sean V. I hope you will enjoy it. Hello, John South. I see Fisher's carriers being kept with the home fleet, fleeing up other ships like the tourists. That's definitely an option. So, I did my talk about ethics of AI and naval warfare. The professor wanted a UN resolution to ban AI and warfare. The talk before was about how land warfare. And I convinced her that it is necessary. Basically, hypersonics are what's going to make it necessary. It's dealing with the speed of engagement of weapon systems. Right then. Hello. Ooh. Uh, hello, Paul Beswick. Hello, Seneca Nero. Hello, Shumi. Hello, Bugai 89. Hello, Dope Squad. Hello, Wayne Borin. <laughs> Oh. Hello, George Newman. Hello, Felix. Oh, I think I said hello to Felix, but hello, Jamieworth. And hello, Felix again. Oh, good. I'm glad you're going to get it. But I'm going to get the book on Christmas Eve, and it's a Christmas present. Hello, Tanya Veloka. And yeah, USNI. Just keep ba uh, badgering them. This is what happened. I have this feeling because if you read the book, and if I get one of these copies down. This is oh, this is a very interesting copy. This who this one's going to, but if you read the book, and I'll say this before I get in, it says published twenty twenty two. So I think basically, pen and sword ended up got they got so fed up of people asking for it. That they have actually published it. And I can also confirm it is 176 pages long in the British Pen and Sword version. I'm saying that in the British Pen and Sword version because there might be a slight page difference between the USNI version and them. I'm not sure. That could be where Amazon's getting its faulty data from. Thank you, Paul Wessick, for excellent pilge pumps. Hmm. <laughs> Hello, Carl Henshaw. Hello, Stephen Richards. Hello, Colin Cameron. Hello, Trent Talenko. Hello, Cody85. Hello, Ian Carr. Were Courageous and Glorious equally capable at the start of World War II, or was one more modernized? Both were pretty much equally capable. Um, I would argue Cora Glorious has, has been slightly more modernized than Courageous, but she's all, her uh, Courageous's air group have been stood up for longer, so I would argue both are quite equally capable. Hmm. I'm Amazon cancelled my order this fall, so I reordered from your sign website. They have lots of books. They are a publisher, like how so many US colleges have a publishing arm. Yep. And that's another thing I would highly recommend. In my experience, sometimes you find these things on Amazon, and that's great because you can do a bulk order from many publishers, but sometimes going to the publisher site is really good. Pen and Sword moment have a 20% reduction on the things. And there's some good stuff there. Hello, Anna, Anna Rajapol. Hello. I don't think I've seen you before. Hello. Hello, Sean Mack. And hello, Andrew Bend. And basically, hello, everyone. Sean Mack, so you need a carrier to fight land-based aircraft, but the idea that you need a carrier aircraft is just silly, apparently. According to Italians, it is. Basically, they were looking at Aquila for reconnaissance. And maybe some limited air defense once you start getting start they start perceiving the strikes from malta as being a problem but really they're not looking for a strike carrier this is the whole pro this is the thing when we look at aquila and we start comparing it with the graf zeppelin the graf zeppelin is a strike carrier which is one of the reasons why it's if you look at its systems etc it's not really orientated about keeping maintaining a cap and it's also different when you start to look at the different carriers between the us navy and the royal navy and the Imperial Japanese Navy, you can, if you look at the style and the lift layout and the way things are structured, you can tell which navies are thinking about maintaining a cap and which ones aren't. And, you know, a combat air patrol is something which the Royal Navy starts off looking at from a very early time. And this is actually one of the major losses of Courageous and Glorious, because 
Well, they're designed around that from the beginning. They really are. Now, if we consider the origins of Crodus and Glorious and where they come from, this actually has a big impact on them. They are fishers' babies. They are designed to be the ships which Fisher needs. And they're designed as part of his Baltic strategy. Now, I know we can all talk about the Baltic strategy and everything, etc. And honestly, if you want to talk about the Baltic strategy, you want to look up one of, my, uh, one of Andrew Lambert's lectures. You want to read his book on Julian Corbett, which I've got around me somewhere. There it is. Yeah. Hello, Andy. You can go there. This one has or explains all about the Baltic strategy. And really, the Baltic strategy was con Germany into invading Denmark again, which, before anyone starts going, oh, that you'll never con to... Germany had invaded across Jutland into Denmark so many times, you know, the, if you want people who really don't like the Germans, go look at the, talk to the Danish. They're really not keen on them. They do have a habit of invading them every chance they get. Uh, so... It's quite a not. It's quite a likely option, and the idea for how to get them to do it to, to do to, to do it was quite simple. Fisher was going to have all the admirals in turn keep making calls on the Danish embassy and keep turning up, and he knew the Royal Navy's admirals keep going and visiting the Danish embassy would get back to the Germans. The Danish couldn't really say, no, you can't come and visit us, in fact, because that would cause trouble. The British have a perfectly legitimate reason for doing it, because sorting out mutual issues, etc. So, you know, there's perfectly neutral reason. But the Germans would read into it what they wanted to read into it. And so the plan was, you con the Germans into invading the Baltic, into invading Denmark. You then use whatever troops you can get from the British Army to reinforce Copenhagen area, basically turn it into a lines of Torres Vedras, which the Danish themselves had already sort of built across the islands, and support them there and support the Danish troops there. And then the Royal Navy fleet would use that as the back way into the, into the Baltic. And these ships are courageous and glorious because they are so shallow draft could go through the far narrow a far narrower far shallower channel on the norwegian swedish side of the of the Dan of the danish straits and could start mucking up german trade which would force the german battle fleet to come out and fight they would probably have to if you you could pick if you uh, do this plan you block the keel canal then they have to come up and fight in the islands we're in range and support of the Danish guns. If you choose not to block the, the Kiel Canal, then they probably try to be tricky and come out and they try and attack you from behind by going up and round the outside of Denmark. In which case, you find them in the North Sea exactly where you want them. That was basically the British idea. And force the Germans to either come and fight them or concede because they've lost control of all their trade. And you have to remember, putting in a distant blockade on Germany, all these things, it's never quite that quite that strong because of the neutral powers, Norway, Sweden, etc., and to an extent Denmark, and the trade that goes in through the Baltic coast into Germany. So you do that. This is what it's all designed around. It's a perfectly valid, perfectly logical, and dare I say it, almost viable strategy. In the way I say almost viable, the big problem is the British Army is all committed, committed to the Western Front, so there's no troops available to do it. Life happens. Um, not sure what that is, but a foul. Sorry. My sister got some Jelly Belly fruit mix. And... Um, First one I tried was really not good. But uh, because of this, the criteria for them was they have guns, which mean that any cruiser won't want to fight them. Which I you see they don't. They do. There aren't any cruisers out there which really want to take on a 15-inch gun. 
They have plentiful uh, capabilities versus uh, destroyers. Hence the multiple treble 4-inch guns. They even have some AA with some high-angle 4-inch guns. And they be fast and shallow draft. They're good for this. And they are good-looking ships. In a sort of style. Myself, I would have been tempted to go with 9.2-inch guns. And I would have been tempted to go with a sort of renowned style layout with 9.2 inch guns but they went with 15 inch guns because again this will force the germans to bring out the battle fleet to come and hunt them down and that's the idea force the germans to come out How stupid was the loss of Atrius Glorious? Oh, I'm going to be getting into that, so you're going to hear me ranting about that plenty. I take Tegra and KMS Graf Zeppelin would have been Tallboyed. KMS Graf Zeppelin would have been sunk long before Tallboys came into service. In the nicest way, the Royal Navy had strike carriers that would have used them. They wouldn't have trust, tr trusted any of that to the, um, uh, to the Royal Air Force. Hello, Gary Sarsky. Thank you. Incar, Courageous name has been reused for the nuclear sub, but Glorious and Furious have not been. Uh, Pro Class Glorious sounds rather. Um... Well, let's put it this way Courageous is fine, but Furious sounds angry, and if you look at the current Royal Navy's naming of ships, they have tried to stay away from sounding quite so angry and quite so aggressive. There was HMS Invincible, but uh, we'll leave that to one side. Illustri it just about managed to push through that one. Illustrious was... Mm -hmm. He noticed that the third one became Mark Royal, though. Um, yeah, Furious not being reused. But there's that's kind of sad because Furious is actually quite a good ship. My favorite was Adra Furious an eighteen inch gun test bed ship, really. I think she was more uh we have eighteen inch guns, what are we gonna do with them ship? All right, so the, the Graf Zeppelin is never going to having kickney sign taped us back. Yeah, the Graf Zeppelin has some interesting design issues. Um, M Dr. Marcus Faulkner, whose Naval History War on f on Twitter is possibly the best authority you've got on um, Graf Zeppelin in the English-speaking world, if not the best in the world entirely. And I were as, uh, the more I chat I chatted with him, him over the years about the Graf Zeppelin, the more I've come to be convinced. Whenever I look at the plans for her, that the Germans had no concept of what naval operations were like, and really they couldn't, they didn't, weren't going to, because the only way they'd have it is if they listened to the Japanese. And they're really the ja the Japanese membership of the Axis comes rather late in the 1930s, and the Japanese aren't that keen on sharing with the Germans the fruit of their knowledge. Cody 85. Too bad that Glorious has had such fine armor. Not. That's one of the things. They have fine armor for what their role is. They don't need better armor than that. And they're also the courageous class. Um, just point that one out here while I have it. But no. Their armor is 2 to 3 inch belt armor. 0.75 to 3 inch deck armor, 7 inch barbettes. They're basically a large, well, 
the argument I would give them is I, I would almost call them a light cruiser. But everything's designed around the idea of them actually having to get in and out places. I also notice that they have torpedo bulkheads as well as general and as normal bulkheads. Which is kind of interesting. And you have the fact that they are built by Courageous is built by Ellswick. As is Furious, and Glorious is built by Harlan Wolf. And they're built quickly. You know, Courageous is laid down 1915, March. She's launched February 1916. She's completed October 1916. That's a very, very quick build. That's a very quick build. Let's be honest, that's a 19 month build. Glorious is May 1915, launched April 1916, and completed October 1916. So she's even quicker. She's actually completed on the 14th of October. Um, Courageous is completed on the 28th of October. So if we think about that, Glorious is built in... 17 months. Furious is June 1915 and she's completed in June 20, 1917. So she's two years. You could argue that it's the joy of actually having to work on two at the same time is what slows down Furious, uh, uh, Courageous and, uh, Courageous and um, Furious. But we don't know that. Hello, Mano1640. Hello, Night Heron Productions. <laughs> Mano1640, when did Harlem Wolf Cease exist? They still exist in Belfast. They're still there. They don't build, they do build ships, but they have an interesting time. Harlem Wolf are still, part, are still there. They're just. Mm, they're a more interesting organization than they used to be, perhaps, in terms of interesting in terms of their well, they're a shipyard, but they don't really build sh ships at the moment. They mean building more wind turbines and things like that, but they are talking about getting back in shipbuilding for um building the literal strike ships and the various other things which the British are talking about. Right. Courageous is the one that gets torpedoed, for starters, Tobias GR3. Glorious is the one that gets run over by the evil twins. And it's worthwhile thinking through this ship, because... Okay, their displacement is 24,210 or what, long tons. That's 24,600 normal tons. And in deep, it's 27,420 tons. They've got a fairly decent length. They've got fairly decent speed. They're able to get up to 30 knots. Uh, they have 16 single 4.7 inch guns, AA guns as of 1928, and in 1930s gain at least three quadruple 40 mm pom poms. Belt is two to three inches thick, so they've got decent armor and roughly 48. Now, aircraft. Now, I would say this, okay? In the late 1930s, one of the things being considered at the time was the possibility of extending the flight deck to the full length of the ship and maybe including overhang, stretching it out so it's all on the same level without the bump, moving the accelerators forward. As you can see, she's got twin accelerators. And using the space that would be gained underneath the, uh, underneath the flight deck on the uh, forward hull as more hangar space. I haven't included in my analysis any likelihood, any chance of that happening or not happening. But I honestly believe if one of them is damaged earlier in the war instead of just survives and actually has to go into a yard either in Britain or Canada or America, that more than likely gets happened and what ha happens and what you see come out is a full length flight deck, courageous or glorious, which would have a big 
big impact. Vision, how well would Courageous and Glorious have fared against the pocket battleship drafts fate? Well, it depends. If they have their aircraft in the air, they could well have done okay. If they have their aircraft on the on the in the in the hangar, then they're probably going to be in trouble. But they have got a top speed of thirty knots, and if I'm not mistaken, the Deutschland class has a top speed of twenty six knots. So if they're up to speed, they could outpace the Deutschland class, whereas the Shan horse. Well, their top speed is 31 knots. So honestly, again, it's one of those things. If HMS, Courage HMS Glorious gets up to speed and spots them far enough away, gets up to speed, she probably makes it to a British fleet before the Sharnors catch her because the Sharnors have to work up to 31 knots. She has to work up to 30 knots. And one knot is 31 knots is not going to catch 30 to 30 knots that quickly. Especially not if that thing fly along, uh, was flinging along at 30 knots is using the wind over its flight deck to launch torpedo bombers, which are coming at you to try and it would be express permission to try and stop you tracing their ship. Um, that will tend to make a crimp in your day. Mm -hmm. So, okay, how would the original non-carrier version fare against the Deutschlands? Well, the Deutschlands wouldn't like the 15-inch guns, but their armor wouldn't be that great against dealing with 11-inch fire. So, well, again, she'd be far, they'd be faster. So basically, they could dictate the battle and the pace of battle by being able to go 30 knots to the Deutschlands 26. So it would be, it would be a true battle cruiser versus um, battleship sort of style fighting, aren't they? Night time practice. I've heard the hull can support such a rage due to light construction of vessels. A great sense of it. It was possible. It was possible. The Royal Navy had looked into the idea of doing it, and they were considering it. Uh, it would require some strengthening of the hull. It's one of those things. When when someone when I talk with various academics who look at it, they go, "Well, yes, they looked at it, but they decided it was in impossible." And I looked at the actual files, and they didn't say it was impossible. They said. It was cost prohibitive under current conditions. So basically, that means under peacetime, we're building new carriers. There is no point in doing that. But in the wartime conditions, you pay the money and strengthen the hull. So that's what you're dealing with, Nighthound Productions. You're both right and wrong in that sort of you're right, it is impossible, as in cost prohibitive. But it's cost prohibitive under peacetime conditions. Wartime conditions. And it's like most things. We're always right and wrong. And that's the joy about history. So it doesn't more aircraft if the hangars were extended? I, I I would say probably considering the way aircraft sizes grow up, I'd say they maintain the 48 the whole way through World War Two. That's what I'd reckon they do if there's their aircraft car, if their hangars extended. I they would maintain an aircraft of four, a group of forty eight even to the end of nineteen forty five, and would therefore be pretty useful. Turbo so GF three. Did these older carriers have modernization plans, or was a Malta a better alternative than upgrades? Well, a Malta would always be better than an upgrade, but let's be honest, you don't have you have the yard space to do an upgrade on one of these is far easier to find than the yard space to build a Malta. Fitting one of these in for three months of work and then three months of fitting out, it, that, that that's fairly easy to fit in. Fitting in a ship for two years, uh, for both slipway, then, uh, then all work, that's more difficult. So the thing is, that's your options. And they could have sent it to America to be upgraded without too much trouble. They could have sent it to 
Well, Singapore was actually one of the places they were considering sending them to be upgraded. Uh, Night to Carry Friend. Why are Sharnos and Nathanow called evil twins? Since FGS Giant Nathanow is a hunt class training frigate, Nest Sharnos modified Black Swan class training frigate. Uh, well, when they were these two, they were the evil twins. When they were the um, uh, battle crew. Uh, well, the battleships. Very small battleships. But battleships. Kenry, would the flight deck have had been have had had to have been expended to support larger planes like Avenger or Hellcat? Not really. It was quite heavily built. Uh, and you must remember the it's not so much the flight deck that needs to be expended; it's the accelerators need to be enhanced. They have two fairly heavy duty accelerators, but they would get new accelerators as part of any upgrades. So they'd be like other ships, which had basically went into the war with a rest of wires capable of doing one uh, capable of dealing with aircraft up to a certain weight and accelerators capable of dealing with an aircraft up to a certain weight and then by the end of world war ii they have wholly new accelerators which can deal with much heavier aircraft and wholly new um arrest the cables which can deal with new aircraft uh, the new aircraft which have got heavier Congressman, in defense of the Panther Chief, the diesels that gave them excellent acceleration, so they might have landed a hit or two before um, Courageous Glorious got uh, gotten to speed. If surprised, if. Most of at 31 knots, they're going to catch empty fuel bunkers pretty quickly. That's the other thing for the war, Sharnos. Matt Tickerin, the two courageous class wouldn't be able to take F6F Wildcats. Why does that matter? They can take Seafires. The you see, um Night Six Territory One, that that's the thing. You can go, they won't take Wildcats. Well they'll take spit they'll take Seafires, they'll take Hurricanes. So they're fine for the European theatre. And honestly, have if you have a look at this ship, have a look at the size of the lifts on her and proportional. And this design, as you can see, there's another point about Courageous and Glorious being built around air defense. Look at where the lift is. The front lift, literally, you can pull a fighter up if you want to, to put on the accelerators and keep it, put it up in the air. You can also take fighters when they're small enough, straight out the forward part of the hangar, and they can go straight off the ramp and fly off and fly out. There is... This ship is designed around providing a strike group for the fleet, but also air defense for the fleet. That's what they're designed around. That's what they're for. And that's what the Royal Navy is thinking in the 1920s when they're building. They're thinking about it maintaining air group in terms of air defense. They're thinking about it maintaining an airborne strike, on-call strike capability. They're thinking about maintaining reconnaissance capability. That's what this ship's built around. John Evans, what would numbers look like if in the Pacific with a deck park? Oh, probably about 60, 70 aircraft if they're using deck park. If they're doing a deck park, which they may or may not have done with these. If they, I doubt these would have made it to the Pacific in terms of British Pacific Fleet. There is part in which thinks they could have certainly made it to the early part of the Eastern Fleet. But, yeah. That's good. Courageous versus Deutschland. Courageous can maintain a range where her 15 inches are useful are in useful range against Deutschlands, whilst 11 inches aren't in useful range for the air return of our. That's probably what they go, to, they go for. Tobias Geoffrey, I'm smitten for the Maltas since Drax's video on them. They sound amazing. They are would have been amazing. They would have been really, really good. And they'd probably be in service till about Honestly, I wouldn't be surprised if the if the Maltas are built and had actually been finished in the early 1950s, they would have probably been in service till the 1990s. We might have even maintained one one who become a um a, a museum ship. Peter Dawson, how high were the hangars? Mm, they were decent sized. They're not massive, but they're definitely as high as the hangars in Furious. And again, they can take swordfish, they can take albacores, they can take the aircraft. Which, I, look, I I I do not see these ships, even if they do stay in service, ending up with. Probably, possibly Grandma Avengers. 
but I can see them easily operating full Mars. They definitely operate. They operated skewers without any trouble. I can see them operating sea fires. I can see them operating. <coughs> Probably could operate barracudas, judging by the height of them and the fireflies. So I I think they would be okay. I don't think they. I, I think the air group issues can be overstated. And I think in the end, honestly, the Royal Navy would find a way. That's another reason why you actually do the full length flight deck. Because if you think about it, if you do the full length flight deck, one of the things you can do is raise the height of the hangar the whole way. You could also, in the nicest way, if you don't... I, I, again, you have to remember when they were looking at the pre-war planning and pre-war ideas of possibly modernizing these ships and giving them a full-length flight deck, they were worried about treaty limitations still. Again, World War II comes along, you don't have to worry about treaty limitations. You just don't. You don't. The moment war starts, all these things, go, all those things about cost and treaty limitations go out the window. So suddenly it becomes, is this engineeringly possible? Yes. Do we want to pay the money for it? Well, at the moment, uh, how soon are we going to have new carriers available? How quickly can we build carriers? <gasps> okay, so how quickly can we get this carrier booted up to a level which is more useful? Okay, can we do that while fitting alongside other projects? Yes, let's go. Because again, you go, well, it's a carrier. Oh, right. Well, is it going to make drain on our armor plate supplies? Nope. Okay, so it's regular steel, which we have a lot of. Will we have to do major engineering work? Will we have to give them new engines? No, they're fairly decent engines. They've been for an upgrade already in the 1930s. They're okay. They're reconditioned. All right. Are we going to have to fit new accelerators? We're going to have to fit new ones of those anyway. All right. You build it. And they might actually get... Uh, they'd also probably get radar and flying de and more other flying things. <laughs> See, Richard, did they have armoured flight decks? Not, no, they didn't have an armoured flight deck. Again, I see them, especially later on in the war, if they're still in the war, as being Atlantic ships. It's for operating the Atlantic and clearing and doing the duties there. Maybe in the Indian Ocean, taking on the role or doing similar duties to HMS Unicorn, as we'll be discussing this later as they get on. By, uh, hello. Right. So, no, no, Roger. Okay, I see. The sources I read made it seem that it was physically impossible task. So six months from into dock to back into commission. Then, well, yeah, that's roughly what I would estimate based on. And I would say on those sources, Night Hammer Productions. <sighs> This always sounds bad to say, but it's not me picking on my colleagues or saying anything wrong about it. I love my colleagues as historians. But there is... I was... My dad was, of course, was a naval architect. My, I come from an engineering family. I tend to look quite deeply into the engineering responses on these things because I'm naturally inclined that way. And go and read them. And... It's one of those things, it's when you go, you read between the lines, you go, well, the weight would have to go up and that would put it beyond treaty limits. So da 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 da, and da da da. And then you go, well, as it is, saying they can't do it justifies them buying new carriers under the treaty system, which is fine because they want new carriers. That's good. But you have to remember. As far as carrier services goes, these are mostly ended. These end the service in 1928. They're roughly 10 years old when World War II begins. As carriers, they're much older ships. They are 20 year old hulls, and the Royal Navy's trying to make the case for replacing them. But that's under peacetime conditions. Under wartime, well, again, they don't. So, and, uh, Courageous doesn't survive 1930. It doesn't survive into 1940. And glorious 
doesn't survive 1940, so war doesn't go on long enough for the Royal Navy to really flex their muscles with them. Ian Carr, pre-war captains of glorious read like a who who's a who's who of later RM leaders. Yes, she was definitely a a favoured ship. Vision, what is an accelerator? An accelerator is not an early catapult. There was a difference between them. Catapults were what were put on surf on ships like battleships and cruisers to launch aircraft off them. They were catapults and they were a slightly different system. Accelerators were what put on aircraft carriers to launch them. Nowadays, we call them all catapults because that's what the US Navy started to call uh, called them. But the Royal Navy differentiated two because of different systems. And the US Navy at the beginning differentiated with two. But then they standardized on just calling them catapults and standardized on one system. And as the Royal Navy went through World War II, they kept calling them accelerators. And then after World War II, well, they became catapults because they were using a very similar system to the Americans. And we all called it catapults. And it made sense to standardize on the language. But because I've spent so much of my life doing this research, when I'm talking about them, especially in relation to ships in the 1930s and the early World War II, I tend to differentiate between two, two and automatically call them accelerators and catapults. No, sorry, large museum ship in the UK. I thought there was a national razor blade shortage anytime someone suggested such an absurd thing. Uh, the thing is, a multi class would be World War II adjacent and would have survived long enough the whole way through the Cold War, etc. Um, could have done the Falklands War as well. You never know. The Argentinians might have been really silly. And they might have made it. They might have made it. Because, again, as... Drac is fond of saying, and a couple of other people agree with him, it's the grand uh, grandparent syndrome. So the thing is, if you survive long enough, if they have survived from 1950s after being started in World War II in the 1940s, and have made it through to the 1990s, that's 50 years. So first generation, that's 20 years, takes them to 1960. They're cut in the 1960, we're in they're gone. They get into the 1980s, <sighs> Oh, they're suddenly special ships. They get to the 1990s. Ah, hey, 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 we're buying, we're, we're, they're, they're going for, you know, they're going to be a memorial or something. Do you remember, I'd have thought as Furious had RF Hurricanes as soon as Sea Hurricanes were available, the sisters would have had them on board. I'm sure they would have had. As soon as they were available, but they weren't available till about 1942-ish, really. 1941-ish, 42-ish. Nice to create run. So there are 16 fighters, 16 strike fighters, and 16 type to uh, torpedo bombers. Uh, possibly, or possibly 24 of each. I don't, uh, Knights of Clarion, unless the IJ and Long Lancers killed them, I don't think they'd ever get in range of IJ and Long Lancers, because I don't think they'd ever be deployed that there. The Kevin Ray, could they have been used later in the war as support carriers like Unicorn, preparing replacement aircraft to use front? Potentially, but they could have actually been used instead of Unicorn to be the centerpiece for escort carrier strike groups. In car, more capability than Argus, Hermes, and Eagle. Uh, pretty much the same level of capability as Hermes and Eagle combined, each of them. Bud Guy 89. Well, one of these go up with 4Z. Can we... You're jumping ahead, Bud Guy 89. I'm going to get to this. So what did Glorious do in World War... Look like in World War II? Well, she could carry up to 48 aircraft. Uh, when she first recommissioned as a carrier, she carried fairy flight ca uh, fly catcher fighters, uh, Blackburn Dart and Blackburn Ribbon, torpedo bombers, and fairy 3Fs. That was her airstrike group. From 1933 until 1940... Um, when squadrons uh, during which squadrons were replaced by flights, or displaced flights as units of organization in fleet air arm. And I love this picture because this picture is taken from Ark Royal, 
and it basically illustrates the Royal Navy was doing multi-carrier operations whenever they had multiple carriers available. This was the point. If they had enough carriers for a multi-carrier operation, they were doing it. <sighs> From 19, uh, then 1933 until 1940, she had 802 Squadron, which flew a mixture of nine Hawker Nimrod and three Hawker Osprey fighters, until they re-equipped with a dozen Gloucester Sea Gladiators in May 1939. 812 and 823 Squadrons were embarked for reconnaissance and anti-ship attack missions. Uh, they flew Blackburn Ripon and then Blackburn Baffin and finally Fairy Swordfish torpedo bombers, as well as Fairy Free F and Fairy Seal, I reckon that's so true. In 1935, she gained an extra squadron, a fourth squadron, which was 825 Squadron. Initially, they were with Fairy Freyfs, but the squadron converted to Fairy Swordfish in May 1936. So please think about that. In 1936, her air group is made up of 36 Swordfish. And 12 sea gladiators. Okay? Think about that when I'm talking later about Taranto. And I'm talking about operations. The fact is, when she's doing the original con the original concept for Taranto and the two strikes, was they were each going to be comprised of roughly 18 swordfish. Because Glorious has 36 swordfish. So rather than a dozen aircraft in each strike, it would be an 18. That has a consequential knock-on. The trouble is Eagle, Tobias GR3, is she doesn't have enough space to carry big aircraft. The thing is that the Maltas are built in the 1950s. They could still carry very big strike aircraft and the Royal Navy wouldn't be having to replace carriers. Uh, and they wouldn't have had to go through the Victorious Saga. They wouldn't have gone through all those costly sagas. And they'd have a core of four carriers to build around and project British power around the world. And that would have kept them going for about 50 years, probably. Sorry, Mike, are you saying you could have converted them into forward aviation support ship? That they could certainly have done some of the roles the forward aviation support ship did. That's a great only one would survive. Only, yeah, I, I, I don't think all four would be it, but I wouldn't be surprised if... Well, you don't know. HMS Malta might be taken to Malta, but I wouldn't be surprised if the one which would be named Ark Royal survived. Vision. Argus was used to lie in World War II despite age of capabilities. In 1942, pressed into use frontline service with a Malta convoy and torch. Primary used as a plane ferry and escort carrier. True. But guy did you When did the RN get, start to get US carrier planes? Uh, they start to get them in roughly 1941-ish. Roughly. Because the first generation of um, US Navy carrier planes which come over are not really modified for carriers of the British. We're them their Hellcats, which don't have wild cats, which don't have folding wings. Sorry, got my cat wrong. Team Richards, if they did the deck, deck length, and do they upgrade the air guns? I am guessing they probably do modified air guns. Probably they go from the single four inch to some kind of. Well, let's put it this way: they probably put in some four point fives or forty more forty millimeters. Sure, it's, I think it's also helpful to have a background of people, how people write in a certain discipline because they each have their own way of saying, well, we could do that, but we need more. Mm -hmm. Incar, did, Car Incar, did carriers have the walrus aboard on wheels? Sometimes they would have walrus as aboard. And those aren't often included in their air group numbers. So that's a very large fight of the strike aircraft disparity. It makes sense pre-radar. Because pre-radar, what are your strike... You have to remember, the strike aircraft, swordfish, are your reconnaissance aircraft your and your strike aircraft and your anti-submarine warfare aircraft. 
So if you think about it, that you're thinking of it in terms of that's 36 strike aircraft to 12 fighters. When actually you should think about, well, that's 36 aircraft to cover strike reconnaissance and anti-submarine warfare and 12 to cover air defense. So that's roughly, you know, you think about it, if you're maintaining a couple of aircraft airborne at all times and reconnaissance, and um, maybe a couple airborne in case they're providing overwatch to try and spot enemy enemy attacking aircraft coming in and you start to work through it the 36 does quickly make sense mm -hmm. john Martin, is it based on japanese style of attack or equipment plans both um they have a slightly different style of operation, but they've come to a similar conclusion. Many similar conclusions. So, commissioned 3815, she's what, 35 centuries laid down, both walls, all those honors, and she is still being sent for scrapping? Ye verge of that very special grandparents tradition. Why? Uh, I think you're talking about HMS Furious, and because she hadn't quite. Well, hang on though. 3815? That wouldn't have been Curious or Furious. Furious was 17 commissioned. So I'm not sure which one. That's good. If Malta got Asia's Malta, would its navy become the largest in the world when we should by percentage of population serving? Um, I, I think they'd get HMS Malta as some sort of um, museum ship. Uh, five two seven two seven. Oh, quintuple five. In your opinion, will LHD LHA air vessels be relevant to warships in modern conflict and use as escort carrier for convoys or low intensity theaters? Apologies for the tangent. Probably, if there are enough of them available. It depends on what's your priority. If your priority is amphibious operations, they're going to be off doing that. But if you need an escort carrier, well, there's your escort carrier. Melanie, I'm lost as to what you're talking about. Which uh, ship? Because I think it's Furious. I think it's Furious, but I'm not sure. Um, Inca. Don Mintoff with a carrier. Mm. So I think perhaps think too much like an American. Our carrier, I believe, had a two to one, a two to one fighter die scout bomber, torpedo bomber ratio, at least roughly for the Octane Lexington. Yes. So basically, think you're again. You're thinking about the US style and I honestly you sure about that two fighter to dive bomber scout I'm not sure if that's what it's like at the be in the 1930s at the beginning of World War II. it might be World War 2 it might be later in uh, during it but it's not I'm not sure if it's like it then hello Dan Freeman war spite ah war spite oh good lord well war spite is yeah Warspite is a special case. Um, that is, I would argue, Warspite is a bit of a, a bit of a victim of a vengeful Labour government. We'll leave that to one side. Who just didn't like her? Had a vision. Had postman just dropped off a magazine proceedings, and from Dan under the book, the Marine personal narrative. Mm. Anyway. Glorious. There she is. She's doing multi carrier operations. And this, of course, is May 1940. This is off the coast of Norway. The Royal Navy's doing multi carrier operations. And. Um, okay, so this is my point. What does Furious get up to in Model 2? She's not subject of this uh, discussion, but she is part of it. Well, here are the battle honours for HMS Furious, and they rather detail things. Prior to being a carrier, the name Furious has the battle honours of Crimea, uh, Crimea, 1854 to 56, and China, 1856 to 60. As a carrier, she knocks up Narvik, 1940, Norway, 1940, 41, and 1944, the Malta convoys in 1942, North Africa campaign, 1942 to 43. That is a picture of a sea fire coming up. Again, she has a very similar layout, although she is the older style ship. You always have to remember that Furious goes through a transition of conversion. And it's kind of obvious she does.
HMS Furious does not start out. Well, how do I put this? Uh, do I have a? I have a transition picture of her at some point. Uh, uh, there is a reason why she has the interesting line she does. You also have to remember that Furious does not get the same level of um, work as the other ships do in some respects. So, yeah. This is HMS Furious at one point in her con conversion history. Uh, that's her when she's being used to launch airships and carry fighters and she has a forward hangar and an aft hangar and all sorts of weird things. And by the end of World War II, she's operating fairy barracudas quite happily. And this is HMS Furious in 1941, I'm just about to put up. Because I one of the things I did was I, I gathered a lot of pictures of these ships, just because, frankly, they deserved it. There you go. And as you can see, if you look at this picture, she's got hurricanes on her flight uh, on her flight deck quite happily. She's got the capacity to pick them up to launch them. She's got the space. She also by this point has a double four inch anti aircraft gun sitting for uh, sitting in the center of the bow and um, that was certainly another option for what they might have done they might have ended up with some there are glorious and courageous do by nine uh, do sort of well glorious i think by 1940 as we can see, if we go back to this picture you can see the guns she has on her forward flight deck a flying opposition I think myself they would have all Furious is doesn't. Furious is an issue. Because as lovely as she is and as capable as she is she's been for a lot more work. A lot more chopping and changing and a lot more structural mucking around than Courageous and Glorious. So doing the modification to her of extending the flight deck, etc. would probably be would be prohibitively difficult. And it's also another thing is finding the time to do it. Because again, when you lose Courageous and Glorious, you lose two aircraft carriers. And that means all the operational capability you'd have had from those two aircraft carriers, you lose. So that time available. So you now need to maximize it, maximize your other ships until you get new ships. Whereas if you have those two available, taking one carrier out of service for a few months to do an upgrade. Well, it's going to be six months. We can maybe get it down to four months if we work really, really hard. And Harlan and the Wolf really pull their fingers out. Well, that's suddenly a lot easier to justify when you have two more carriers uh, available than when you have two less carriers available. When you go from seven down to five, rather than, uh, or, you, you know, because you think about the Royal Navy starts World War II, it has Ark Royal, has Illustrious soon coming in, Courageous and Glorious, Furious, Eagle, Hermes, and Argus. So they have eight carrier flight decks, really, they can call on. Now, we can all talk about Argus's quality, but she, frankly, she's still being used for as long as she can viably be used. But when you lose two, you go down to six. Well, that's a big drop. Because if I say I'm taking one out of service for three months to modernize it, I've still got seven. But if I got six and I take one, I've got down to five. And the, I've still got to cover the same amount of area. That's a lot more difficult than going, 
I got seven to cover that area. I've got reinforcements. I'm not really not. Aviation isn't my strong suit, but two to one, uh, one, one seems ratio seems the best generalization I can make for the American carriers. Going backwards to the nineteen thirties, it's probably more like two, 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 one, or one, two, one. Yeah, it, it, it's basically as time goes on, these things do change around. As sad as it is, eventually government will completely explain it. Yeah, they, they. It, it just seems to me some of the report, some of the stuff I read, I. I there are people who are going to say no, 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 and there are uh, there is me that looks at it and goes, mm. and then there's the conservatives don't really want to do much to save her, because the conservatives don't want to put in the money. Hello, Vice Admiral Nelson. P. Dawson, the Americans had two squadrons of Dauntlesses per carry, one primarily for bombing, the other for scouting. Yeah. Richard, if the Malta was laid down, do you think she's built through deck, or do you think they suspend work on when she's built angle deck? Probably suspend work and build her angle deck. That's certainly what I'd like to have seen. Samuel Thompson. Mm. John Evans, when did someone realise the master, uh, master funnel in the centre line was a problem? Uh... <laughs> oh, God. What's also interesting to note is Furious is then built without a fl without an island structure because they want to try it out, and um, because they tried it on Argus and they're now trying it on Furious and they're going eh, no no no. And of course, Hermes and Eagles both have, Eagle both have islands, and then Courageous and Glorious. We've got islands mainly because the thing that really restricts Furious and makes her less capable than Courageous and Glorious is because of all the trunking of freaking funnels that goes through what spaces could be used for a hangar. So instead of just having the trunking go whoop, up and out through an island, it goes, oh, we're going to have it go up and we're going to have it go along and come out the sides. That's all space you could use for aircraft gone. Mm. It would have been mm. and I say Aaron, I do understand the argument about the repair costs for War Spite, but I think a, a campaign of national subscription would have paid for it. Does that make HMS Furious the carrier operator most generations of aircraft? She's certainly definitely pushing and she's certainly pushing for it. Now is a C far on the lift. Chip forty two. Did Nark Royal also go down that kind of time frame? Yeah, she did. And Hermes. The only two pre World War Two carriers which survive the World War Two are Furious and Hermes. Fur no, Furious and Argus. Illustrious was started pre World War Two, but ended service really in nineteen forty. <sighs> I like how half of the video is topic is a topic and the other half is Malta. Well, Malta does get there. 
Right, okay, everyone, I'm not getting into the regular discussions we have on government spending and how you, uh, the government debt versus normal people's debt and how they spend it back, guys. Inca, Argus had a small retractable bridge on the front, uh, front of flight deck. Yes, she did. Again, not really practical for operating aircraft. Trent Clark, was there any talk about replacing A Eagle and Hermes pre-war with light fleet carriers? No. They were going to be replaced by illustrious class. If you look at the actual thing, what's happening is the illustrious class are going to come into service. And the idea is the first aircraft carrier to go out of service is going to be Argus if you're maintaining treaty limits. And then it's going to be Furious. Uh, no, Furious is going to be kept in service. It was going to be Argus, Hermes, then Furious, then Eagle, then Courageous, and then Glorious were going to be replaced. That was their sort of plan. And their plan was to build up to eight aircraft carriers. John of Mara, so Furious and Cargo had the same problem with smoke. Yep. Cameron, trunking taking space away from aircraft was a consideration in where the engines are on the Queen Elizabeth, new Queen Elizabeth class carriers. Yes, it was. I know, because I know one of the people who was I knew one of the people who was involved in the argument over that one. Okay, Sam Thompson, that's completely off this topic. That uh, I think Zukaku that question is going to be for Sunday's live, so I'm going to leave that one. Five two two seven five five five. In in regards to Iron Brew, that's Star Cloud. Who did you um obliterate to obtain it? I envy you as an American. Uh, uh, the advantage of being British and also the advantage of ordering in bulk today derived from Mazda. Hmm. Right. So, here is the point. Sinkings of Courageous and Glorious. Well, as we all know, Courageous, she is sunk because of the conclusions drawn from pre-World War II exercises. Those exercises had shown the absolute essential nature of a carriage anti-submarine warfare. Thank you, Churchill, for cancer, for stalling their production. And yes, Churchill, you do get the blame for that one because pretty much everyone was there. That you had a you had to choose between two thirds of people saying don't and one third saying do, and you went with the one third who said do when you were first Lord of the Admiralty again. However, you then rectified that by accelerating and pushing carrier production as soon as when, after you became Prime Minister and realised, ouch! Okay, so leaving that to one side. Courageous is doing anti-submarine warfare operations and her aircraft and they're out hunting submarines. And these groups have been very effective in exercises, but they weren't proving to be, how do I put this, as effective in peace, in... in wartime because a of distances but also arguably because they didn't have enough escorts if you consider when they're doing the exercises in the interwar period they're usually having a flotilla of destroyers involved and they usually have some sloops as well as backup and basically some of the destroyers and some of the, uh, and some of the sloops are staying back for the carriers close quarters protection and at this point, they're starting to they they are down to relying on speed of the carrier movement and one destroyer for protection, close in protection against a submarine getting through the other destroyers, hunting them. And Aztec, of course, is not proving as effective as they presumed it was. So yeah, it life doesn't work out always always as well as you think it does. And courageous gets sunk. Glorious, glorious, on the other hand, is a different scenario. Glorious is given orders to proceed back to the UK because, frankly, they are abandoning Norway. They are giving up. We can all debate the merits of that one and whether or not it was stupid to do it when they did it or not. But leaving that to one side, they, gave, they were going back. And instead of waiting for the fleet, she come charges off home. Arguably because the captain has plans to court-martial his chief of flying because his chief of flying 
had disagreed with him about launching aircraft being on a strike mission that was ill-defined, ill-organized, and ill-prepared. <laughs> no, you cannot have my mince pie. I caught it and I saved it. Anyway. Okay, you can have a biscuit. Don't tell your mummy. So tell me off. Good boy. Not only is she coming back alone with just two destroyers for escort. It's a beautiful, clear, visible day. She's not proceeding at full speed. And um, she has no aircraft in the air. None at all. No overwatch capability. No alert aircraft. Nothing. The thing is, both get lost with the vast majority of their crews and the vast majority of their aircraft and, of course, their ships. So, they are quite big losses. Take that in, car. Nice well, the RN fleet to count uh, Plan Z, according to track, was to be three illustrious, one indomitable, two in black, all and four audacious, and King of Malta. E yes, that is according to track, and that's a fairly you, that's a fairly sensible idea. Um, I would certainly agree, but that's again to plan. Uh, that's again to deal with Plan Z, and that's his response. His arguing of what the response to likely Plan Z would be. I'm talking about what their plans for replacement of their existing carriers were in the 19, late 1930s. Pre World War II, no Plan Z, and this is dr probably during the time at which they were still trying to get the treaty to work. So we're talking 1936 37, the planning. I just learned that Churchill ruins the Admiralty's plans to defeat Ma defend Malaya on some other channel today. Go listen to Brew Ship 75, uh, a Bilge Pump 75. You'll enjoy it. <laughs> Death Squad. Government finances are like personal finances, except you can print your own money, decide your own income. And so, in conclusion, government finances are nothing like personal finances. Hmm. Um, Thompson, how many Blackburn Blackman squadrons could fit in the Courageous or Glorious? Occasionally, they did actually have um, a flight of them, but they were only carried when they were still using flight operations, so they would have normally carried six. In winter, would they have extended their flight decks like the Japanese did? Um, I mentioned this one earlier, and already talked through. There was, it was, it was viable in wartime, but in peacetime, they were using it as a justification, the cost and difficulty of doing it under treaty of invasions as a justification for getting a new carrier. I think everyone, Churchill probably slept soundly because, in the nicest way, he was uh, courageous. It wasn't his or that wasn't his directly his order that caused that one. That was all that's on the Admiralty. That one sending her out doing that because again they're using the false positive of the exercises, which is a problem. The exercise had shown how successful it was; they hadn't shown the problems with it, and it won't be the first. It wasn't the first time, and it won't be the last time that what looks like a great idea in peacetime exercises turns out to be an absolutely terrible idea once you're fighting a war. Because in peacetime exercises, the submarines hadn't bothered with the destroyers because they'd wanted to take out the battleships. In peacetime aircrafts, the uh, peacetime 
so operations, the air uh, exercises, the aircraft had concentrated on the battleships, not the destroyers, because they'd wanted to take out battleships, because that was what you scored and won you the exercise in peacetime. In wartime, the aircraft don't give a flying hoot, they just want to sink an enemy ship and to get out of there, preferably alive and in one piece. It's There's a different scenario going on. Did the captain of Glorious know there was a war on? Ah, uh, hubris. He didn't think there were any. He believed there were no, uh, there was nothing by Sean Austin and Nisen out there. But there's also Lord Cork and Ori, who's a bit responsible, as I'll be getting on to in a second. Hmm. Well, that's right. So, on average, the RN loses one carrier per year until 1943, roughly. Okay, the 85 and Glorious escorts went down with it. Yeah, and they bravely attacked the, the Charnel and Eisenhower nice to try and get her, give her space. Drinkling, whatever orders Churchill gave Glorious, and he didn't. There, there's always something of, did she, was she going off on a secret mission? Was she doing this? No, she wasn't. You know how I know she wasn't? There, there's a very easy way to work out why she, uh, why she wasn't off on a secret mission. She'd used up all her attack, all her land attack bombs. She only had armor piercing ones left. Supporting Norway operations. Yeah, Glorious did draw a short straw in that case, in uh, with her captain though. I think just in August, she's expendable. Well, here's the actual interesting thing, because in 1913 exercises, usually the carrier supporting such anti-submarine warfare operations had been Argus or Hermes or Eagle, the smaller carriers, but they're all busy. So they try and do it with Courageous, a full-size fleet carrier, because she's bigger, so she must be better for this job. But that means she's a far more tempting target. It's remarkable how few total duds ended up in senior commanders given each branch of the military in every country exploded 10 times, 20 times, and 50 times from its pre-war size. The joy is that war tends to weed out the duds quite quickly. <laughs> Don't worry, Ben Greg, I'll look for a question. My damn productions. I imagine this will be mentioned, but how much could be done to improve the, re the range on these ships? Um, their range is a bit worse than the other engine carriers, so using those as base points weren't use, uh, useless, but the range was a limiting factor. Uh, don't worry about the range. They're not going to be used outside the Atlantic and maybe the Indian Ocean. I doubt they're going to go for a full Pacific War operation. Anyway, so here's what happens instead. Well, it's actually quite easy to fix Glorious. In fact, fixing Glorious requires one person. Vice Admiral John Cunningham asked for an escort, uh, is, uh, is aboard HMS Devonshire, is under orders to escort the Norwegian royal family to the UK. He asked for a larger escort. Cork and Ori says, ah, you're fine as you are. But it's very, um, uh, this almost option is that he would have got assigned Glorious and her two destroyers as escort. Which would mean they'd be proceeding as a free. Which would mean the conversation would go like this. Is Glorious maintaining a air patrol? No, Vice Admiral. Send message. Ask why not. Glorious is captain. I don't think it's necessary. Vice Admiral John Cunningham's usually, uh, normally, taciturn and very straight to the point response. Captain, you are fired. Commander of, Commander of Glorious, you are now captain. Launch air patrol. 
Now, that would then can lead to a very interesting scenario because if Glorious has an air group, has aircraft up, A, they probably spot Sean Horse and Eisenhower, which means they may make up to call for more reinforcements, in which case, War Spite and all the other rather large battleships, which are rather fast in the area, will start heading in that direction quickly. But also, she'll have time to launch a strike, in which case, Sean Horse and Eisenhower might get damaged by a torpedo, in which case they might get slowed down enough that actually they get caught by battleships, by Royal Navy's Queen, uh, Queen Elizabeth class battleships. If not, maybe Renown, uh, maybe Renown catches them and they don't manage to run away from her. Leaving that to one side, that's not a good scenario for the terrible twins because they could get taken out quite early on in the war. Or alternatively, they might see this aircraft, the aircraft spotting aircraft, they might spot the spotting aircraft and decide to run off as quickly as they can anyway. And they might not launch, the, the spotting aircraft might not actually see them. Who knows? But the thing is, it's a very easy fix because if they are sailing with Vice Admiral, who is under orders to make sure the Norwegian Royal family get home safely, the question, the question of whether or not there will be aircraft airborne to be, can, be maintaining an aerial search, an aerial or security, will be a moot question. Because if there is not, the Vice Admiral will be getting you shot. And John Cunningham is a very good Admiral for doing that sort of thing. He, he, he suffers fools about as well as... Well... Any Admiral of the name Cunningham has ever suffered fools. Um, and then there is Glor Courageous. Well, actually, that's even easier to fix than anything. Because here's the thing. German torpedoes in Narvik famously don't work and don't go off and don't hurt HMS Water Sprite. And they actually try and hit HMS Ark Royal a couple of days before. And they don't go off. So the ones of actually working on Courageous are actually rarer than you might expect. But either way, if she's actually hit by torpedoes, the Royal Navy's going to go right then. We've been lucky twice. We're not going to be lucky a third time and stop it. In which case also, and here is the other interesting thing, you could have had Courageous available at, during Norway as well as Glorious. In which case, they could have been operating as a pair. If they're operating as a division, they'd automatically have a rear admiral with them. In which case, again, the glorious scenario of no aircraft airborne would never have come up. Because the rear admiral aircraft carriers would have been going, Excuse me, Dumbo, where are your aircraft? I don't believe we need to be operating them. You are fired. Bye-bye. Shut up. It's it's very simple. The trouble you have with Glorious can be fixed in one simple movement if you have any senior officer there who outranks the captain actually with the task group. Even if you just have a more senior captain with the task group, even if he's in an, another ship, it gets solved very dramatically quickly because a senior captain, he would be the task force commander and would go, what are you doing? Why are you being a moron? Which is rude, but viable. Generally, how did Courageous' escort compare with that of CVEs later in the war? Um, it, it, numbers are broadly the same, but remember, they're off hunting submarines. They're not escorting her. Their job is to fan out and hunt submarines, so that's She's not being, she's not, uh, you, she's not basically going into, um, you know, uh, having an escorted battle group maneuvering. It's uh, we're fanning out hunting submarines, and you're providing air support for that. Magnum Robinson, do you think Cunningham would have rushed in to help in Devonshire if not for the passengers? Yes, Devonshire wasn't close that close to the action, but she was within radio range, and she would have probably come in if she hadn't been under so much orders to protect the passengers. So anyway, what would be the modern equivalent to Courageous and Glorious? There is no real modern equivalent to Courageous and Glorious. If you're talking in size and scope, you're probably looking at... Probably, maybe even the current Queen Elizabeth classes, but probably the older Invincibles, etc. Uh, but no, probably yeah, something in between that. I don't know, there isn't really an equivalent to them.
Hello, Frank Spadano. Five, uh, two, seven, uh, fives, two, seven, quintuple five. Uh, were you surprised at the fact the USN pulled the Royal Navy and performed a non-lethal rendition of Admiral Bing upon those involved in loss of the Bon Homme Richard? Um, not surprised. It, uh, sometimes they start, you have to start doing it. Van Gogh, my understanding of the question. The common line is, at the end of the war, battleships were obsolete. How far off war do you think it was for one carrier to take a battleship reliably? Um, Probably about 19... Well, I would say after you've got the intro introduction of the Black mm, Blackburn Buccaneer. So I'd say 19... Well, pro probably actually... Mm, yeah, actually, no, before that. So let's go 1950. Probably about 1950, 52. They could do it reliably one on one. But even then, they could do, probably do it reliably one on one earlier than that. It's just as long as they can keep the range up. As long as they can engage from range in which their aircraft can attack the battleship, but a battleship can't hit the carrier, they can just keep rearming and going back again and going back again until the battleship sunk. So that's the thing. It's range that matters. Frank Spano, will you ever get to do a video that goes over it or answers a question about it? Might do. Well, killing the evil twins years early saves the UK time and money and resources. Yes. Hey, just slow. What have I started? <sighs> You mean they wouldn't have promoted Mr. I Don't Believe to Task Group Commander? No, he wasn't really that senior as a captain. Uh, he would have had to be... You would, In fact, honestly, here is the thing. If Philip Vian had been in that task group, in his destroyer, he would have been in charge, not the captain of HMS Glorious, because he was more senior. So there are the whole list of captains who are more senior to the guy in Glorious is quite long and quite large and quite loud. And we can all imagine what Philip Vian's response would have been to you're not flying air support. <laughs> uh, I want you to stand on your flight deck. Stand very still. Good. A and B turret ready. A and B mounts ready. Aim for that gentleman standing there. Fire! Right then, I have promoted the executive officer of Glorious to commanding officer. By facto that the commanding officer is no longer in one piece. In fact, he appears to be a fine mist. <laughs> Chevy Knight of 42, not sure all admirals would overrule him. Uh, most probably would. In fact, no, in the Royal Navy by 98, it was well stand. It was, let's put it this way. Not every admiral would agree with you on carriers replacing battleships in terms of their capabilities, but all ca admirals, pretty much universal, were, want, uh, believed carriers were important and aerial reconnaissance was critical. So all of them would have had air. Uh, there is not a single admiral who would not have gone, why are there no aircraft airborne for, air, uh, aircraft airborne to, uh, for reconnaissance? Um, Sheppy42, again, please go and listen to Bilge Pump 75. You'll find out that's actually not quite correct. He certainly didn't think he didn't need aircraft. He didn't think he had access to aircraft. He was kept being told by people they weren't available. And he was trying to do the best he could under those circumstances. Uh, Adfab, if two aircraft carriers, then they'd have had a heavier escort. Probably a big gun aircraft escort. Probably a heavy cruiser, at least. <laughs> uh. Captain Glorious, I'm going home to fire court-martial... Uh, my air commander. Rear Admiral Aircraft Crows. Funny that. I was heading home to fire someone, but not your air commander. Yeah. <laughs> mm. 
John Shane, Doctor, you, Doc, you're being too polite calling Glorious Captain a moron. I would be a lot more harsher, so harsh that I can't post on YouTube. That's the point. That's all right. Yes, he was in the process of court-martialing his, his air group commander. Uh, no, he didn't. He did like aircraft. You have to remember the captain who was in charge of HMS Glorious. He thought aircraft were kind of. Well, he comes from a submarine background, and he thinks you only deploy aircraft when you need them. It's he, he treats aircraft like they're big guns, so you fire them at the enemy. Boom, boom, and that's just his policy. Whereas in reality, aircraft are more like flotilla defense in some respects and that you keep a constant presence out there uh john Farrer, if i was coming in with glorious i'd be throwing oranges and spiral uh, signaling where is the air cover it, it there, there wouldn't be that many signals it wouldn't need to be this is a vice admiral if the vice admiral is signaling to you that there needs to be air cover there will be air cover or there will be pain <laughs> three stars do not in my experience that captains can just about argue possibly with a commodore rear admirals it starts to get iffy Vice admirals, it's not good for your career prospects. Full admirals, it's not good for you not sleeping with the fishes. And admirals of the fleet, if you argue with them, well, goodbye. Um, not sure about that one, uh, Sam Thompson. <laughs> Uh, Dan Lanyon, not blindly following misunderstood, misheard orders. No, he wasn't. He was the captain of Glorious. Was uh, you know the one of the reasons actually that's given that he might not have been flying aircraft is because of the time taken to launch aircraft would have delayed him getting uh, would have meant he wouldn't get back to the UK as quickly as possible in order to do the court martial. Hello, Shrike six one six. Fives two seven quintuple five. My apologies, but how do you spell Captain Phillips' last name? Uh, Vian V I A N. And if they didn't have the start knowledge, they would have a staff officer with that experience. Pretty much. Again, Vice Admiral. What if Gra uh, Gra uh, Graf Zeppelin was ambushed by Warship, uh, War Spike? Um, there's no more Graf Zeppelin. Agriff, I'm presuming running as cap makes the CV easier to spot, does it? Not really. The aircraft don't... You know there's an aircraft airborne, but you don't know if it's coming from... Because you have to remember the surface ships are... It's not like today where escorts have helicopters and carriers have planes. In those times, the, the, the planes would be flown off by surface ships as well as by carriers. Sword, the spotting aircraft going off from most of the battleships in... Norway were swordfish, so flying swordfish does not give away your position or tell people who you are. Ian Windsor, how did he get command of one of the few carriers in the fleet? Let's put it this way, there is a certain admiral who is famed for his anti-submarine warfare commands who really, really liked him. So if Glorious came home, who would have been court martialed? Well, if he got home safely, probably not him, but he might not have been in charge of the carrier for that long because the court martial can go back on back of me. As was famously shown in Band of Brothers and happened in the story of Captain Winters, uh, of, well, at that point, Lieutenant Winters, um, and Captain's, uh, I think it was Captain, who was it? I forget what the other guy was. But um, some uh, but um, court martials can go bad on the prosecuting officers.
Add up. How come British naval intelligence was so poor as to not know two German battleships were out in that naval on Norwegian waters? Oh, they knew. They. It, it's one of those issues. They have an idea something's out, but they're not sure where it is or what it is. And honestly, the captain wasn't taking much notice of it. And also Lord Corkinori again. Mm -hmm. Bamba So, it's a fun time for them. It is a fun time for them. But if both carriers survive, well, we have this happen. France still falls. And so, my thinking is if they're going anywhere, they're going to end up in the Mediterranean. There are other options. Courageous could certainly end up running some sort of operation in the North Atlantic. I could certainly see the Royal Navy deciding to maybe be a carrier task force like kind of Force H from Gibraltar, but basing it on Courageous and an S uh, and a surface uh, and some sort of large surface command, one of the mm, I would argue probably a battle cruiser like again with Force H, but out basing it out of Iceland. But we'll never know because she's not there. But then they definitely do take part in a deal with the fallout from the fall of France and the Mediterranean after that, and all of Mediterranean. And I'll get into that in a second, but I'm just gonna, I put this slide in mostly just so I could quickly have time to catch up with questions. I thought there'd be a few here. And I was right. Hieroglyph. In the early war, everyone estimates the effectiveness of air attacks on ships, but overestimates the efficiency of anti-aircraft guns, and also underestimates the number of aircraft needed for cap. Um, actually, I would say on that one, the British have been fairly spot on. They knew they needed eighteen since exercises in World War in the interwar periods, but the thing was, it takes them a while to get up to the point at which they have eighteen, and. Again, those exercises have. Uh, then there was a debate of whether or not radar actually lowered your requirement of aircraft, and it was very quickly found out that radar didn't lower the requirement of aircraft, which caused the rebalancing of air groups in the armored carriers. Yeah, uh, well, the armored hangar carriers. Night heron, uh, night heron productions. There'll be air cover or there'll be pain. Hmm. In 1941, ships carried about one quarter fighters. They went up to one third by 42 and as much as 50% by 1944. Yeah, it, life changes. Also, as fighters get more general purpose, this is the thing. Larger fighters actually are fighter bombers. They're more general purpose aircraft, so you can carry them instead of some of the strike aircraft. So that's also an underestimated uh, and under-acknowledged factor in that growth of fighter defense. Adpap, also, given the glorious and courageous work of former battle cruisers, how come they weren't operating speed which make ambushes hard and possible? And that's the thing, they could go at 30 knots, but, um, again, bright, uh, various pe uh, people being, mm, and, but, uh, Night Hagliff, also, their engines had been reconditioned a bit. They were, uh, they, they were 30 knot ships still in 1939, 1940. Not for long. They could go. They they would. I wouldn't like to keep them at thirty knots all the time, but they could go thirty knots if they wanted to. Um, Vision. I would take it that if Dylan, uh, Dion Hughes had not gone on the ship, he would have been court martialed. He would have certainly faced a lot of very tough questions and might have found that his career got significantly shortened. Gary Thousand Sobel, thank you. 
sorry, the prosecuting officers or convening authority? Uh, he was the prosecuting, uh, well, he tried to be the prosecuting officer, but he was the convening authority. And about this, Glorious only had about half of the boilers working when they were caught. Yep, that's another problem. Trent Langer, Dr. Clark, how does Mayor Zell Kabir go for more use case CVs present? Well, I'm glad you're asking that question because that basically jumps onto my next slide. So, this is the question. And I think about it, it's quite an interesting one because it depends on whether Glorious goes on early through to the Mediterranean fleet or whether she goes with Illustrious. But I think Glorious, if either, any of these ships go to the Mediterranean fleet, it's going to be, glor it's going to be Glorious. And if they're both around, they're both still around this point. But Merzel Kabir, well, if you turn up with free carriers, you can do a whole lot of operations. The fact is that these ships might well carry, by this point, and I would argue they probably would be carrying, roughly 24 to 36 aircraft, uh, 24 to 36 swordfish, probably a dozen or so skewers. And maybe even some full miles already. So you could see mixed groups of 30 to 24, 12 and 12. Either way, that's quite a significant strike increase for the Royal Navy if it comes back to dropping mines. And if they're doing the mine drops, it, nicest way there'll be a whole lot more fighters for defending the, the mine dropping aircraft and a whole lot more mines able to be dropped. But also... If we see, look at that, the Strasbourg manages to get out, etc. Uh, the Dunkirk sort of beaches herself. The Provence and the Mogador both sort of beach themselves. We'll leave that to one side. But what would most likely happen is they would get hit a lot harder. Because, again, it's turning up with free carries. So you've got all that viability. Also, in this map, Force H is off up there because Force H is concentrated around its one carrier providing its information. Whereas if you have a couple of carriers, you might have had another carrier off up that direction. So it might have been Strasbourg is going away from one carrier concentration straight up to, Hello! I'm a battleship and a carrier. Hello, we've been watching you coming for us. We'd like to say hello. Hello. How you doing? Here, have some 15-inch guns. Oh, and torpedoes. They're so nice. The point is, if you turn up with free carriers, the odds of France getting away with a lot more, uh, getting a lot more out of there goes down dramatically. Because you have three times the capability of launching. You have three times the capability for keeping aerial reconnaissance in the air and keeping overwatch. You have three times that ability to engage. And this gets worse as you go through the operations, as you go through what can come up. Agra, thank you for the correctory, Ferdinand. Oh, literally, it's because they've done so much work on the engines in the interwar period and they have nursed them. Uh, you have to remember, Courageous and Glorious's engines have been looked after and have been reconditioned and taken care of. Again, part of the construction process that they go through in the 1920, late 1920s while they're being, is they're getting their engines looked at. Vision. Yeah, Guy Dylan Hughes is a very good submariner. I, I have no doubt he's an excellent submarine officer and is really smart, but he's not good when it comes to carriers, as uh, carriers, and he doesn't understand carrier operations. And this is what happens. John Varro, in Atlantic, would it be based on Greenland Iceland with Glorious or Furious, uh, Battleship, uh, maybe a CN, uh, probably Courageous and probably a mm, 
without a probably a, probably just courageous on its own, and probably a battleship or battle cruiser. Yeah, because I think Glorious would if a Glorious ends up anywhere, she ends up in the in the Eastern Med or the Mediterranean fleet. Hmm. No, sorry, did she have water tube boilers or something that takes much longer to be raw line water tube? Uh, Franklin, I'd like to say, what if Shannos and Nazano ran into a hunter killer group from later in the war? I think if you're talking about if they run into something like Task Force, a uh, Force H, mm, they could face some serious issues. But it depends. If they run into, uh, well, uh, if, if they run into something with enough firepower, they're going to get into trouble. Frank Spider, how would you describe Jamie's channel as opposed to yours, uh, yours and Drax? Um, <laughs> I love Jamie's channel. J you, you, you have to see the amount of hours and effort he puts into putting together every single video for his channel. It's like, Jamie is one of those people, it's kind of like Drac. When people will sit there and go, oh, you know, it, you uh, to be a professional historian, you, ha you have to have a PhD or this or that. And I sit there and go, so what you're saying, to be a professional historian, you have to write 100,000 words. Yes, and have it properly assessed. Okay, by the best people in your field who will review it. Yeah. And critique you. Yeah. Experts. Yeah. So, what do you put about Jamie, who's written, I, I guess his website must be something like 500,000 words by about now, and all those videos are hours of videos, which are critiqued and referenced by the very best people in his field. I would say that's the equivalent to a PhD. And then we've got Drac, who does exactly the same. And honestly, it's different styles. We all have our, we each have our own different style. I could, I love Drax five minute videos. I can never do a five minute video. I can do a one minute video, 60 second video. That's fine. And I, I can think it through and plan it. But a five minute video, I will automatically will end up being about 15, 20 minutes for me. Because that's the way I think. I don't, I, I tried it earlier on. I, I, I tried to do it, but I can't. But the thing is, we each have our own styles, and that's the good thing about it. We're different, but we're, I would... Yeah, I love their channels. Nice to go Strasbourg gets sunk. I would pretty much argue, yeah, that nothing's getting out of Mezal Kabir. Dunring, maybe Mezal Kabir goes differently because the French realised they totally outgunned, numbered, and opt to join the Free French instead. Potentially. Potentially, they realize that, but there again, it's going to be the same French admiral in charge, so um, probably not, because he's still an idiot. Colin Cameron, so Glorious goes to the Mediterranean I, Colin, I say Glorious goes to the Mediterranean fleet. That means she's in the east of the Mediterranean. Um, Ark Royals with Force H in the west of the Mediterranean. She might get courageous as well as backup, but please don't jump. Let me talk things through. Um, Night Heron Productions, a bit off topic, but if Hood's engines were treated like Glorious and Courageous were in the late 1920s and 30s, how much better should she have been more? Probably maintain her speed. Sure, Mike. Drac at this point might be the most prolific naval historian ever. Uh, there is what only... Well, I'd say it's possibly between him and Jamie for the current naval historians, but I'd say Norman Freeman probably has them both beat. But that's just Dra that's just Norman Freeman. He's about uh, Norman Freeman's about one of the few exceptions uh, people who managed to produce that much. Um, 
uh, it would take a while, Melanie 1640. It would take far too long. Anyway, Melzo Kabir, that has a factor. But then we have Operation Hats. It takes place in early September 1940. Newly commissioned HMS Illustrious heads to reinforce the Mediterranean fleet. And HMS Eagle had to come from the other direction. She had been refitted in Singapore in 1939. Um, by July 1940, after patrolling the Indian Ocean for the surface raider, she was transferred to the Mediterranean fleet and would take part in the Battle of Cambria, uh, uh, Calabria. So, July 1940, they bring across Eagle from the Indian Ocean. And September 1940, they, uh, they take Illustrious across. So the point is, would Glorious replace either of these deployments, or would she be in addition to them? I would argue this is quite a concentration of force, and this is being done by Pound. And he's doing this because he wants Taranto. He's building up. It's very. It's not long after Taranto operation, etc., is done that actually they start to reduce the carriers down. So they're almost putting the carriers into the Mediterranean to try and do Taranto. So I reckon Glorious goes across, and I reckon Courageous saves with Ark Royal in Force H because she can do thirty knots. She can keep up, and if you combine those two carriers into Force H, and then you've got five carriers in the Mediterranean. Why are carriers important in the Mediterranean? Because the Royal Navy is very strong, conscious of the Italian Navy. They think they're going to try and be a risk a fleet in being. They think they're trying going to do German things. But unlike the Germans, who are quite protected and nestled in and haven't got that much concentration of a fleet for them to go and attack, they know the, the Italians are going to concentrate in Toronto. They know what the Italians are going to do. So having carrier groups in availability, having more carriers, makes sense for the Mediterranean. They also realize they're going to be in land-based air range, and they're going to need fighter defense, especially for putting the stuff through to Malta. So expect them to be a carrier heavy area of operations. Sam Thompson, would you prefer an eventual American copy of your new book sold, or a super chat? And happy Christmas to you. Um, ooh, book sold because I want more people to read them. Although I do like super chats because that, that, that those go to my takeaway fund. <laughs> but leaving that to one side, um, yeah, book sold. Because again, the more books that are sold and the more books that are ordered from USNI, etc., and from C4 uh, and from uh, Pen and Sword the more likely they're to sign off on my second book, which I've got currently got a proposal, the proposal with them. And hopefully that's going to be started soon. But, uh, you know, so the more sales that go through, the more likely they quickly sign off and I get the advance from that. And that advance will go towards my probably new tower PC or my new, new car, depending on when it comes through. So, Johnson, did Glorious and Courageous have armor flight decks for being part of Club Med? No, they didn't. So, uh, th this is the thing. This is part of the, this is going to feed into my point about them being in there. I don't. I think they're going like Eagle. I don't think they stay for long. <laughs> Book reviews drive sales. Yes, they do. Hieroglyph. Thank you for it. So, here is Operation Judgment as it would as the reality was. It's 21 swordfish, 15 silmars, and two sea gladiators from, from HMS Illustrious. Uh, I've been over this in the Taranto video many times. Here is the, as it would be with HMS Eagle. And I've taken both to 18 swordfish. So you've got 36 full swordfish and nine full mars. And again, that's kind of interesting because that's about the same attack group I was planned from HMS Glorious. Because Glorious was going to have 36 swordfish. And twelve had twelve sea gladiators, so you know that would have. This is what Glorious could have achieved on her own. So here becomes the really interesting thing: if we add in Glorious, and this one, what I've done is I've just doubled the illustrious air group. So I've just said, look, this is what they have. I haven't tried to invent or theorize an air group. I've gone right, and they probably would have had the full Mars. They take up slightly more space. They might have had some sea gladiators. And I've worked it through. And it's based on 48 swordfish. And 
three waves, each of nine torpedo armed swordfish, seven uh, seven bomb swordfish, and two fulmars armed with flares and bombs. So it's each group wave, each attacking group is eighteen aircraft. But here are the results that come in. Conte de Cavour hit by uh, three out of three because of her positioning. Andrea Doria hit one out of four. Dulio hit three out of three. Littorio hit six out of nine. Vittorio Venito, one out of five. Gilio Cesare hit zero out of three. There's probably more damage than the crews and all sorts of things. And also, you have to again go with Glorious has a lot more experience in her air group and has a lot more capabilities because of that. So that might well have an impact in terms of what uh, operational successes she achieves. But that's the pro that the thing is, this is only one scenario for that. But in this scenario, I don't see the Italians having more than Giulio Cesare available for at least the first uh, next six months. If anything. However, there is some reality of this as we're going on. And I'll just answer questions and then I'll get into the next one. Manitoba, what are you trying to get as a new to you car? Probably another Subaru, maybe a Volvo. Um, Frank Spada, I have I, I need a decent sized estate car and it needs to be quite safe because I take my cousins and my dogs around in there. So I like Subarus and I like estates. Thank you, that's a real good episode. Uh, for example, let's see. Replace Sharnos and Nizno with another two battleships. Do they get better, do better or worse? Oof. Any other two battleships? Any t uh, other? Sh if they're slower, they can maybe have more of a chance, but no. It's basically you don't want to have two battleships turn up if your carrier's not doing anything to defend itself. Trentalango. Crete only gets chancy for the Germans with two more Royal Navy flat tops in the Eastern Mediterranean. So only gets chance. Uh, basically, my theory is Tr Crete gets chancy for the uh, for the, uh, the uh, for the Germans if the Italians won't do the amphibious operation that reinforces it and makes it viable. If the Italians have lost all their battleships, they're not doing it. Sean Mac, did you roll some dice for that? I did. I rolled a lot of dice, but also I got a friend who's got a version of Harpoon, which has World War II put on in it, to do a lot of a lot of uh, simulations for me. And they have been paid in that I ordered a pizza to be delivered to them. Hello, Lords. Yes, you want to pizza, do you? Okay. And they very nicely went through this, and actually. Um, I'd had the, one of the interesting things was I didn't know this was going to be requested as a patron or anything, but I actually had this scenario run when they did the original Taranto stuff, but I didn't have time to put it in the Taranto video. So some of these slides are actually from the original draft of the Taranto video. Uh, what did the hit on the Andrea Domare damage and same with Vittorio Venito? Uh, the Vittorio Venito and the Andrea Doria both. Uh, both of the times the damage seems to come, and if we remember the picture I gave you of where they're positioned in the fleet, both times it comes bow it comes bow on, and seems to damage them. Colin Cameron, are you going to build your tower or get pre-built? Depends on the cost of things. At the moment, it's working out cheaper to buy a pre-built than it is to buy a. Uh, to to build it myself, but I prefer to build it myself. So if I can put the money in and get to build it myself, I'll build it myself. Go on, sir. Five dogs, Volvo North Contest. Um, Subaru Foresters are also very very good. It's it's one of the things I love a Subaru. I, I have a Subaru Impre had a Subaru Impreza. I have a Subaru Impreza, man. But unfortunately, its gearbox is gone, um, and it's very very expensive to replace. It's far more. It's actually cheaper to buy a new car than replace the sort out the gearbox. Even if I go and hunt down a a, a scrapyard model, because they they seem to all be being and they let's put it this way: the collector's market is piling a piling into them. So no, no, YouTube forces historians to be more prolific. It does enable us to be more prolific. 
Anyway, Toronto and Illustrious Glotterus is one scenario. First point. Or does it depend? It's pretty difficult because it depends on how long they survive. For example, does Courageous keep operating with Force H or get moved back to the North Atlantic to form a rover force? If the former, does she get hit by torpedoes instead of Arc Royal? If the latter, does she get base of Scarbaclaw? She made cornerstone of a task force operating from Iceland to try to cover that gap, which could then be used because if you think about it, if you have a carrier operating from Iceland and covering that gap, you could position her using the Enigma data, etc., to ensure her fighters keep intercepting the focal, uh, the um, condors. And if she keeps intercepting the condors, then they're not going to be guiding in the submarine wolf packs onto the convoys, which could reduce the attacks on the convoys. So that would have that knock-on effect. If present at Taranto, the damage done to the Italian fleet would be that much greater which would have an effect on Crete, of course, and if it was a support, might never arrive. More importantly, the large number of aircraft carried between the two carriers might make the Operation Umbrella that much stronger, which means they might actually operate, they might be more successful at Crete. It also has massive impacts. Those represent two of the more experienced carrier crews the RN had in 1939 and 1940. Their losses were an incalculable loss of not just ship, but personnel and operating experience. Skills which could have prevented loss of HMS Ark Royal. Because one of the problems that Ark Royal happen, uh, reveals is your lack of carrier experience damage control officers. Whereas if you think of that, you have lost two sets of carrier experience damage control officers and trained up at all levels in Courageous and Glorious have gone down with Courageous and Glorious. So which is why you have a flood of officers who are not carrier capable or carrier experienced going into senior positions in Ark Royal, in all these other ships. Because they're having to make up for numbers. Whereas if you have those two carriers around, the, 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 you can for, afford to trickle more in at a lower level than the senior officers you can promote from the carrier experienced officers. So you're less likely to lose arc roll to bad damage control. You also have more pilots, observers, fitters, all with more experience. And this all has an operation impact. The point is almost certainly until 1944, these two ships would have been available, would like Atrus and Curious have been used probably more so as they were newer than bigger than her. And let's give it its first thing, okay? We've talked about... We've talked about Toronto as an example, but let's put it this way. If I have three carriers operating in the Mediterranean fleet, well, if I have two and I have an operation going, I'm only going to keep both operating as much as possible. But if I have three and one of those carries is having a little bit of an off time, then I can carry out the operations with the two, especially if it's the smaller one. So that means Eagle most likely gets repaired earlier. In which case, Glor Illustrious, Glorious and Eagle could end up launching the strike together. Okay. That has an impact. Once you start putting your results of torpedo strikes of 36 torpedoes up to things, and potentially you could go even higher because you could have another 12 swordfish on top of that if you've got uh, Illustrious and uh, Glorious at full load. You are talking about a massive amount of hits. And this pretty much guarantees the Italian fleet is knocked out of World War II. Other than... Vittorio Gilio Cesare. Vittorio Veneto gets two torpedo hits. Andrea Dore, two. Basically, none of them can, they, they can't repair anything in time for war, uh, wartime operations, which is going to have a knock on impact for the North African campaign, let alone on Crete, let alone on all these operations, because Hannah, it's like compound interest, okay? If you have more carriers, especially when your carriers are so small in number, Remember when I talked about the giving, I said you have eight if you can't include Illustrious. You lose two, you're down to six. But if you suddenly have two more, then you can increase your number of operations. And you have, you're far more likely to take one out for maintenance. And so you keep increasing availability out of the whole force. This is where numbers matter. So if you have all this, you have a lot more damage done on the Italian fleet. And if you have more damage done on the French fleet, so that they're not a factor, then Force H isn't so critical to maintain, to keep launching Dunkirk and French North Africa. 
And if you have the Italian fleet knocked out, then what do you need to worry about? Well, you can the Mediterranean can you can go on defensive. You can if you have Crete of Africa, and you can probably relegate the Mediterranean fleet to the R class. You can go on the defensive in the Mediterranean fleet. You can go on the defensive in the Mediterranean because you've already secured your areas. Then you can go on the offensive. You can move more forces to the Far East to act as a deterrence force. So Force C could be very very different. It could be an early the actual thing could be the Eastern fleet. It could be Admiral Somerville. It could be a far larger force far earlier on. Even before, could be, it could be formed in mid-1941 when they first start, when they are considering sending a force, but they can't because Ark Royal gets sunk and all those sorts of things. All these things can happen because you don't have these ships. They have a knock, if you have these ships, because of the knock-on impact. P. Dawson, the Condors operated mainly out of France. Uh, yes, but if you have a carrier op group operating from uh, Iceland, then they're going to be in the Mid-Atlantic, which is the critical area. Take care, Jenny. Nice agreement. Butterfly pack. Pretty much, or as I call it, the interest effect. Thank you, Gordon Smith. I do agree on the low Volvo winning for the low, uh, for the veteran hounds. Hello. If you want to be patted, you have to. Uh, at some point, you have to come say hello to everyone because you can't keep making me bend down and not saying hello to people. It's a bit rude. Manitoba, wasn't Enigma information disseminated in such a way that commanders had no clue how accurate it was and in multiple cases didn't believe or our voice ignored it? It depends on the seniority of the officer and who's in charge. Usually Admiral Somerville gets pretty good data and acts on it because he's senior enough that he has the staff he's allowed to. So again, if you put up if you set up a similar force. Hello. Yeah, good boy. Hello. Wait, taxes high and on automatics? No, I was wasn't talking about that, but um, no, there are costs, various costs. It is an automatic gearbox and it is expensive. They have uh, a lot more of um testings. Hello. <laughs> Mm. Frank Spanner, let's see what the condition we expect to find glorious, glorious wrecking. Not very good condition. She took a lot of holes. Sure, the Italian fleet will get back just in time to join the Allies, uh, which would be really funny. Yes, pretty much. Um, what they do get back. I'm again. It's going to be interesting to see what they do get back. In my experience, my uh, my pretty certain that Latorio with six torpedo hits doesn't come back to operations ever, and pro it probably is a mess that's blown up. So Latorio's lost. Vittorio Veneto, because she doesn't have a full crew on her, actually getting two hits could be enough to sink her and take her out for quite a while. Andrea Doria two hits could cause a lot of damage. And Conte de Cavour, well, three hits. Yeah, th there aren't many of those which I'm thinking are going to be coming back into service. Definitely not of them quickly. Yes, the fluffy research assistant is rocking a sweater. Also, stealing only my book signed. It will... I'm going to do an assigning event, I think. That's what I'm going to... That's the only option I can do. At the moment, but I, if I get sent more some books, I will be sending out signed ones as prizes, etc. Things. Uh, he has a Christmas jumper. He's not wearing it yet, though. <laughs> Can I get a poor printed copy <laughs> of your new book? Um, we might do something like that at some point. Anyway, so here is the thing. And I'll expand this quickly to talk about this one. 
even if a arc royal is sunk as ha happens in history, it'll have just a formidable put out of action. Even one of them has sunk. The fact is that there would still be an extra carrier available when force, even if one of the carriers, i.e. Uh, Glorious or Courageous, are sunk, the fact is that there would still be an extra carrier available when force C is being put together. The odds are, though, that the ship or ships would swap places with HMS Victorious, and she would have been sent out to the Prince of Wales and Repulse, maybe even going out early with Repulse to set up a force G, set up force G as it was in the Indian Ocean. In such an Indian Ocean role, she would have been worked up, being capable of reinforcing their training fleet if needed, doing anti-surface radar patrols in the Indian Ocean and deterrence for Japan. Victorious with them would improve their reconnaissance, their ability to break up enemy air attacks, their, their ability to coordinate air defense, and their ability to work with land-based aircraft. This could mean that 4C survives, potentially delaying further Japanese uh, uh, movements on Singapore, certainly becoming the colonel of IBDA uh, and possibly reinforcements itself. Here's the thing that's often not uh, real, uh, f thought of about carriers. If you have a carrier of 4C, does, Philip, uh, does Phillips have to go and do his reconnaissance with his ships, or can he send an aircraft? He can send an aircraft. So suddenly he doesn't need to do reconnaissance himself. He has, probably has radar active, but also has air defense and fighters up, spotting and engaging the enemy. That's an advantage. That can make a big difference to his operational capabilities. This is the thing, carriers are force multipliers. Yes, you have to protect them. And that's the other thing. If you have a carrier out there, you can guarantee they have more escorts with them. Probably they'd have a Dido class with them. For all the great things of a Dido, they are just pretty useful in that scenario. And this is the point. If you, uh, you know, you have more carriers available, you're going to have more carriers operational. If you have more carriers operational, then you're not going to get into the trouble you do. Uh, 52755, uh, if you could execute one Admiral Officer from each Command Navy Model 2 for incompetence, who would you execute and why? Um, that sounds like a um, long patrol topic, so I will leave that for that, because that could take over this entire live. Um, Trent Line, Crete and our hands uh, as a major airbase leaves the Eastern Mediterranean in the UK Lake. This in turn frees up two flat tops for the Far East. Yes. Might occur, assuming the intel in IGN torpedoes is not ignored. Well, the RN again aren't go uh, don't ignore the uh, intel on the IGN torpedoes. They had some intel, but again, go listen to Bill Trump seventy five. You'll hear that talking through and exactly what was going through the RN's mind. Plus, the RN have a slightly different approach to it than the Americans do. Remember, the Americans were trying to were actually getting into fights at night, whereas the RN would be planning on using airstrikes at night. So they wouldn't have been getting into torpedo range if they'd wanted, if they uh, they'd hoped. That would have been, certainly been the aim. Hello. Hello. Right then. And so, because I want to get into the full chat and questions, I'm going to go quickly through the summary point. And I'm going to expand it for a second, and then I'll uh, reduce it so we can do the questions. Uh, World War II was a global maritime conflict. As a result, losses in ships have long-term consequences. A loss of ships equals a loss of capability. Both a great likelihood of further losses, but also more time will be needed to help build up the force necessary to win. So the knock-on consequence of the RN not losing two of its more worked-up, more experienced, and more importantly, larger carriers in the early stage of World War II can have an outsized impact on the loss of two, of, for the loss of two ships. This is because the RN work are keen on multi-carrier tactics and operations. We're thwarted by numbers of carriers available. Two more available equals a greater chance of a multi-carrier operation. So if you have two or three carriers at Merz al the likelihood of significant loss being inflicted on the French goes up dramatically, as that is pretty much going to triple the available aircraft. The same at Taranto. More aircraft means more damage inflicted. What does uh, what that does mean? 
Well, it, does that mean? It, mean, it means the RN has to worry about the French less and the Italians also probably less, which means they might not have to expose battleships or carriers themselves so often to escort convoys in the Mediterranean. They might not have the losses of Crete, and this could all mean far more ships available to meet other tasks. Courageous and Glorious themselves might have had a very similar war to Furious in, but certainly up until 1942, three or even uh, or one or even two extra 40 to 48 aircraft air groups you know, is going to be something the RN would have been very happy with and very useful. And this is the point. If you have more aircraft involved at Mers el Kabir, you probably have a far a much greater reduced French force, which means Force H's, uh, H's role in keeping of the eye on the French goes down dramatically. If you have more aircraft at Toronto, you have more damage done on the Italian fleet. So there again, Force H's role in trying to prevent the Italian fleet going out from the Mediterranean, uh, Gib Gibraltar goes down consequently this is becomes a point aircraft and the it's a it's a force multiplication capability because it as well as it taking out enemies so you have less restrictions on your force you you know you don't have them to deal with but you also that you don't have to deploy so many ships to escort your current forces think about that think about the mediterranean am i if the Italians are reduced to one one battleship and some and some cruisers, well, then most escort operations can probably be taken over by I don't know a single carrier and maybe a single R class. Do you need to have fast battleships to deal with Gilio Cesare? No. Do you need to have fast battleships to deal with? That sort of threat, probably not. You can deal with the R class. So if you've got the R class, if you can afford to use the R class as your main escort to the Mediterranean, think about what that frees up for elsewhere. If you get rid of, if you've got rid of the Dunkirk, uh, sunk the Dunkirks, etc., in the beginning of 1940, and the, Fre uh, and the French no longer force it is no longer a problem down in Mezal Kabir, well, Hood might well go into a refit. If Hood goes into a refit, she's not there when Bismarck goes for the, the Denmark Straits. So it might be a different combination that Bismarck comes across at the Denmark Straits. It might come across Warspite. Because again, why, is Warspite, why would Warspite be in the Mediterranean if the Italians only have Gilio Cesare? They don't. She's not there. They're going to be, uh, Warspite's going to be elsewhere. So Warspite, probably Queen Elizabeth class ships, are going to be back waiting for Bismarck. In which case, Bismarck comes out. But also, here's the thing. If Sharnhorst and Eisenhower have been sunk or damaged by the home fleet because of the carriers actually doing being airborne and actually flying aircraft and Courageous and Glorious perhaps both being there and both escorting Devonshire home, because again, they might be paired up and it might be a fast group to get them home. In which case, they might, uh, Sharnhorst and Eisenhower might have been damaged, might have been sunk. In which case, is Hitler going to risk Bismarck his his only battleship on such a on such a mission probably not. There's a difference between risking risking it when it's one of three potentially four because you've got turbots under construction and coming into service versus risking it when it's your one of one available. You're not going to do that, so it changes history dramatically. Once you have these little things, these are not small butterflies. These are great big tornado sized butterflies. Right. Folks, I'm sure this has been explained before, but what's the difference between a long patrol, a patron, and a brew ships? Okay, a brew ships is a general Q&A slash book review session I tend to do on a Sunday afternoon. A patron is a video which has been voted for by patron, uh, suggested and voted for by my patrons on Patreon. And a long patrol is a recorded video. So a long patrol is basically a lecture. And these are live videos are basically seminars. Right, sorry. Let's see. Are there any holidays or times when the British will not attack anyone in history? No. Um. 
Frank Swan, Dr. C, how many total modern warships did the Exus have that actually posed a major threat to the UK? Uh... Well, if we're talking battleships in 1939-1940, the Germans have the two Scharnhorsts. We can say the Deutschlands pose a threat as well, but they pose a threat as long as they don't find anything bigger than them. And honestly, the Scharnhorsts, again, don't pose a threat as long as they don't find anything bigger than them. And they run from HRS Renown because they're under orders not to get damaged. So, let's be honest, there's quite a lot of things bigger than them going around. The Italians have... Mm, six battleships of which four are modernized world war one ones which can probably have a good impact versus an r class but i wouldn't want to take up again i wouldn't want to fight a modernized queen elizabeth or a king george the fifth or definitely not ron neil nelson uh that no, no there is nothing in the mediterranean that wants to get into a fight with rodney and nelson there is absolutely there are basic there are no battleships in the axis fleet at any point in history other than in the Japanese forces, whichever would like to get into a fight with Rodney and Nelson. If they can't outrun if they can outrun them, they will outrun them to keep her out of a fight with them. Basically, the only ship that would like ships which would like to get into a fight with Rodney and Nelson are called Yamoto and Mushashi. And uh they never do. Sadly enough, because I think that could have been a fight for the ages. How, I don't know if this was covered in a later video, but how much does the retention of Maria throw a, a wrench in the works of the IJ and the IJ in actions, incursions into Borneo and Sumatra? Massively. Because, let's put it this way, let's go through Malaya scenario. Let's say that with K he does have two carriers present. Let's say he has Glorious and he has Victorious present. That actually makes sense and fits with the modern and the other to give up numbers. So, Prince, uh, so he, let's say he gets a task force of Prince of Wales... Uh, Prince of Wales, um, Repulse, Victorious, and Glorious, which is the smallest I think the Eastern Fleet would have been. Probably also it's under command of Admiral Somerville. So what would he do? Well, his options are probably he launches an airstrike, and his aim is to get within airstrike range of the land of the of the attack of the landing operations. So they drop bombs and things on the landing ships which considering their load of ammunition and off discharging that could have actually disrupted the supplies from malaya and then pulls back so they survive so that will both slow the attack into malaya and so on but also we haven't done the knocking on consequences of if the british have secured crete and the mediterranean and have stopped basically effectively stopped the italian convoys how quickly did the north africa the north african campaign end because that's not go and that's not going to happen in a bubble so if the British, if the Royal Navy manages to achieve dominance, rather uh, completed control rather than dominance in the Mediterranean, and it's arguable the dominance in the Central Mediterranean is always a 50-50 game, with, uh, depending on which side is actually turning up in force that day, then it's arguable that the North, the entire North American and North African campaign could have wound down a lot quicker. If the North African campaign winds down a lot quicker, A, you get the Africa Corps is probably part of the forces which go into Russia, but B, you suddenly have all those troops the British have in fighting the North African campaign and all those officers uh, could be deployed elsewhere. So you might well have had more troops. You might have even had a freaking armoured brigade sitting in Burma. Yeah, this is the trouble. It, ha it has quite a big knock-on impact if you just have Mears el Kabir and Taranto go a different way. What effect, if any, would Courageous have had in Norway? Uh, a little bit more air support, but probably not overall change things, because honestly, it's France which decides Norway in terms of what happens in France, not Norway. Five uh, two uh, five two seven uh, quintuple five. Doctor Clark, you shouldn't say these things. I only fantasize about seal clubbing so much. Mm. That's a grand. Does this shorten the war? Well, if Japan gets less of the area they wanted, you also have to remember. What are you up to? What are you up to? Alex, uh, you decided you want to be simple. 
hello. Hello. You want to be in front of everyone. Okay, hello. All right. I don't know. Fluffy research assistant. Um, really sure. Seeing some of these dates, uh, attacks were made. I'm surprised the British don't gift wrap bonds for appropriate holidays while at war. Uh, occasionally they get tempted. Mm. I don't know. I think Nagata and Mutsu would, get, uh, would make a good go at Nelson Romney. I think they'd certainly fight it. Uh, I, I think it would be an interesting competition between the two. John Luke, so then, uh, Doug Clark, Nelson Class H was Rodney versus IJ Nyamoto. How does that go down? Probably Yamoto wins. Probably. But it's going to be a hard won fight, and she's pro not going to go away, get away unscathed. In fact, it could be a constructive loss for Yamoto and an absolute loss for Rodney. Um, in a stormy Atlantic versus an Iowa, uh, if you give Rodney the same commander she has fighting the Bismarck, then my money would be on Rodney, but that's because of the commander. If it's any other captain, it's probably a mutual destruction. And there's a if Poland ordered a fleet carrier and is ready in the 39, that has an impact. It, it's like I said, this is the this has been the difference of two carriers. If you're talking about a difference of an of one carrier, that's still going to have an impact. If you have courageous, glorious, and a Polish carrier, that still ha that has a big impact. You know, the more carriers you have, the bigger impact you have earlier on in the war, because the more aircraft you have for these strikes. Nice turn. Do courageous, glorious, and furious still get scrapped in the end? Probably. Someone doesn't realize he's a toy poodle. He has no concept. No concept at all of the idea of being a toy poodle versus a big poodle. Um, which question I take everyone that I'm not, I'm not the fully scrap answer? Uh, Trunkling, the UK air power freed up for the Far East given North Africa ending 1940, 41-ish, uh, early 41-ish, means a lot of air power in the Far East as well, two RN carriers. Yeah, uh, Singapore becomes a much harder nut to crack. It does. And Malaya becomes a far more difficult because also it's the officers you fear up. You might have feel you might have General Montgomery out in charge in Malaya. Think about that, Montgomery in charge in Malaya with armor. If he's got a couple of armor, imagine this: the seventh day of the desert rats get transferred to Malaya. To, to Malaya. Yowza! In fact, what has struck me about most battleship fights is how much luck plays a part. Shells are, pro are probabilistic as much as uh, as much as simply ballistic. Yep. Serpy forty two. If Poland has a carrier, my argument would be if it's a carrier which is going to be ready for 1939, 1940, it's probably being built in the UK. If it's being built in the UK, it might not well be ready in time to actually be in Poland by the time the uh, Germans attack, in which case it survives. But also, that means the Polish might have got out even more ships because they might have sent them to the UK to escort the carrier. So you might find there's a full, there's quite a hefty task group sitting out here. The war shortening one. Um, it's impossible to say how much it shortens it. I don't see Britain launching an invasion of Europe, i.e., D Day, without America being on side. And that's still going to take time to prepare for. So that's probably still going to be not late 1943, 42, uh, uh, 40 for, uh, early 1944. But so that's probably not going to change much. 
But again, the Japanese war effort could change dramatically because if they don't have, don't get the area they do get, then they're pushed back. If Malaya turns into, my, my theory is Malaya would turn into a sort of slightly wider area version of Guam in many respects. Especially if there's been a carrier strike on the... Um, do you want to get down or do you want to stay up or what do you want to do? Ah, do you want to get down? You're too hot. Or do you... What do you want to do? Oh, oh, okay. We're happy now. If you then decide you want to get up again, you are... Okay, okay you want a biscuit. Again, don't tell your mummy this. It's... World War II probably still breaks out pretty much similar in length as it does, even with these two carriers in. But the Allied losses and the issues might be a lot quicker, uh, more easily dealt, uh, might be a lot less. Uh, you might well not have the Indian Ocean rate, because if you have enough carriers and you have Singapore under control and most of the Malayan Peninsula, then you probably have a very different scenario going on there. You also have far more British forces based in that area, and they might well try and link up with the with the guerrillas in Indochina, which might lead to a very different relationship longer term with well with the whole with the whole scenario in Indochina. If Vietnam as it comes. Montgomery Malaya. Japan is not able to use the bike strategy. Japan is not able to use a lot of strategies versus Montgomery Malaya. Sometimes, what does Poland not build on land if pouring resources into a CV? Um, if they're building a British in Britain, it's probably going to be a case of special uh, a subscription. They almost consider that with destroyers. They might have done a subscription one. John South, if even if she joined the Allies in 1940, even Burn would have been useful. As although by no means a fleet carrier, she would be good enough for anti submarine warfare and escort. Yep. Okay. Be back in a second to answer more questions, but someone's just now indicating at the door. Come on, <sighs> Good one. Don't be. Let's let you out. I don't know. You are a bit of a twitty dog sometimes, aren't you? Yes, you are. And sticking your head in a bush in, when it's wet and then going, oh, I'm wet, I don't know why, is twitty twitty behaviour. Yes, it is. Um. As you can see, the map behind that is copyright to Gordon Smith 2007. Anyone else hearing these pops? I might have it turned up a bit too high. Let me check if I can turn down the gain just a tad and keep it constant. Yeah, that should be okay. <laughs> oh. Flat out the morning, another biscuit. Really? Really? Again, don't tell your mommy. Um.
John Luke, so even though Nelson's up with cut down designs would ruin everyone's day, day any time. If only they were powering around at 27 plus knots, it turns out into a permanent nightmare for enemies. Pretty much. <laughs> Shabby, 94, uh, I don't know how much more uh, much improvement Monty being an amateur than Bill Slim, but still a massive improvement if he replaces Percival. That's what he would replace. He replaced Percival. Mm -hmm. um. <sighs> Trimac, also the good personnel being sent east means that you will have senior command uh, coordinating officers, meaning the Dutch forces are better utilised. Yes. Uh, Sam Thompson, uh, Dr. Aaron was reading IJN codes during the Ocean Raid. Add two CVs and it all gets very interesting. Yep. Um, Frank's one, Dr. C, is it possible all these attempted scenarios, the CVs don't, still don't make a big difference? Yes and no. Um, as I said, on Toronto, etc., the attack is just dramatic. The difference is in the attack, and it's after that that we have to see the differences. So the thing is, they make a difference, but it's difficult to work out how much of a difference. So you can make an argument lots of different ways. But we can tell you that having a carrier, even a single carrier presence with 4C, makes a difference because it breaks up the strike. And that's the point. That's what a carrier does. It gives Admiral Phillips the aircraft he, he thinks he has. Because when he, he makes an agreement, and this is one I think is often, Tom Phillips makes an agreement that aircraft are going to be waiting for him. And he keeps getting messages telling him that aircraft aren't available. And I think, one re as Jamie says, and we've discussed this in various scenarios, the reason is that the strike aircraft he was supposed to have weren't available, but he takes it as meaning all aircraft aren't available. There's a debate as to the signals quality. So he doesn't think he has any fighters he can call on, so he doesn't call them. And he also has issues with his radar and all sorts of things. So if you have a carrier present, A, he'd automatically think he does have fighters to go on because they'd be the one sitting on the carrier. B, you'd have a radar present. C, you'd have escorts present. And um, all those things. If you have two carriers present, because let's say you have Victorious and Glorious, well, he has quite a lot of fighters already in strike aircraft there, so they do make a difference. And that's the thing. If you can hit the Ita Japanese supplies before they're all ashore, that's going to start their movement in Malaya. If you have more troops there, because you've got North African campaign over, so you've managed to move some troops out there, which you could have done, and you've managed to get some commanders out there who are different, then the Japanese are both going to be moving slow, which gives the army more time, and they're going to be facing a lot more a lot troops and better more troops and better led. It has a knock-on consequences. So yes. You can say the CVs may or may not have had a big difference, but the thing is they would have had a difference because if they didn't, then there would have been a lot of very upset people. Cameron, you do realize the FRA's mum is probably can't watching the stream and counting the biscuits. I'm hoping not. I'm hoping... Uh, the FRA's mum is my mum as well, so that, you know I'm hoping that she's not watching the stream. She doesn't usually watch the lives. She likes to watch the one patrols, not the lives. Mainly because she says if she wanted to, if she wanted to cross-examine or ask me questions, she'd do it herself. Yeah, she has plenty of time to do that. <laughs> she doesn't need a video to do it. <laughs> Nice to Wouldn't Hitler, once he has Turpit, still send Bismarck out? If he's lost Scharnhorst and Eisenhower, remember his reaction. He loses Bismarck, he has a panic attack and doesn't want battleships to go out ever again. So if he lost Scharnhorst and Eisenhower... There's Shansky. As much as I don't like Monty, since he has an ego, yeah, but me, uh, tell, show me a general admiral who doesn't, who gets that rank. He was too, uh, he would not give up. He was too stubborn for it. Mm. Uh, 
I was asking, I'd say we're doing build on credit. In this case, French government credit. Um, If the Polish they're getting in, probably on British credit, if it's a carrier. And again, there aren't French... You have to remember, shipyards, the French don't have that many shipyard space, and they're using them all for their own battleships, so they don't have the space. Whereas the British yards do, they do have yards which have space to build a night and carry in that period. So it would have been a British carrier if they'd been building... Or American one. That's the other option. The Polish could have been building an American carrier. There's a significant Polish and American community. They could have been using them. Percival is neither the beginning nor ending of Singapore's problems. It's all the third raiders that surround him as well. North African down in 1941 means UK uh, Army first raiders in Malaya. Or at least the second raiders, not the third raiders. Chevy 48. To be honest, I think the more interesting general in Malaya could, would be O'Connor, but he was sadly indisposed. And again, if he's done, if North Africa's gone better, imagine all those good officers who come out of North Africa, um, who do, who get, who are available instead of being lost or captured by the Africa Corps. So I'm like, also, I think Monty would have had a decent relationship with Slim because Slim strikes me as someone who wouldn't be happy with Monty taking all the credit, but would still do his job. Mm, to be honest, the two would have probably got on quite well, but one would have been coming from one would have been the Malaya command, and the other one would have been the Bur uh, the, Sol the Burma command. So I've been meeting up in the middle, working out who was in charge then. The Indian Ocean raid probably doesn't happen. If Malaya is secured and Singapore is secured, then why would the uh, why would they be going into the Indian Ocean? It the more interesting thing is becomes a Coral Sea or Midway scenario, especially if you have an RN carrier force combining with the USN carrier force. Because let's say Midway is happening, and let's say the Americans know that they're, the uh, Japanese are coming to Midway. Well, the Royal Navy might send their carrier force through the uh, down, uh, through the Philippines to back them up or down south and round. So you might have a Royal Navy carrier force coming in to assist the Americans at Midway. So the Americans might be bringing their free carriers, the Royal Navy could be bringing two or three of their carriers, and Midway could go very, very interestingly. Or it could be a sort of a Coral Sea engagement. Or at Coral Sea, there could be a British carrier force there as part of the, the overall Allied forces, which would, again, change things quite dramatically. <laughs> Thank you, Night Heron Productions. This has been a great episode. It is a courageous an effort. It didn't leave me with fu it didn't leave me was furious. And overall, it's been glorious. Yes, yes, I am. That's sad. I, yeah, we all are. But that was quite cool. Mm, and your point about USS Robin hieroglyph is kind of interesting because you could have ended up with, well, let's put it this way: in the time it takes for the Americans and the uh, uh, Americans and Brits to put their carrier groups, uh, carrier swarms together, they, you could have seen a far more joins up to carrier task force. It could have been two U.S. carriers and two Royal Navy carriers, so an enhanced version of USS Robin, but a more official one. And maybe here is the thing. It could be under U.S. Theatre Command, i.e. Nimitz, but it could be under British Operational Command, because the Task Force Commander might be Somerville under those scenarios. Which would be quite an interesting thing, because if you, if you put Somerville with two American carriers, two British carriers, and the two British capital ships as the far strike ships, that's quite a scary little group for, for the Japanese to find operating in the, southern, in the South China Sea... Southern Pacific area, east, uh, south, uh, southern, and eastern Pacific, uh, uh, and uh, southern and western Pacific area. That's quite a worrying group. Abfab in four C or CV, wouldn't they have been the main targets of Japanese bombers anyway? And they'd have been, uh, they'd have had to have been more ships in the group in cruisers and destroyers. Like. Definitely on the latter main target of Japanese bombers. 
I think yes and no to an extent. They might have been the main target, but also they would have been putting up a lot more air defense in terms of fighters. And I have a feeling the Japanese would have spread themselves between the battleships, uh, uh, between uh, Prince Wells, Repulse, and Victorious if she's there. If it's Victorious and Glorious, then mm, they have four ships to spread the effect over. Nice Wouldn't the Bismarck and Turbs get sunk no matter uh, anyway, no matter what how, uh, Hitler doesn't do? Yes, they, the RAF would have made uh, Bismarck its target because if Bismarck is sitting in a fjord somewhere or sitting in a harbour somewhere, the RAF would be going after it, and the Royal Navy would be certainly going after it any time it shoved its nose out. And probably like again with Fur uh, with the attacks which Furious was involved in, they would be going doing carrier strikes on them. Vision. French should have gone for American built carrier. Everyone should have. Uh, basically, your options are if you want carriers built that have actually slip yards in, in the mid 1930s, are either American slips or British slips. They're the only ones with enough slips of enough size that can actually build them. For example, what was the US single worst month in all of World War II? Um. First of all, I have to decide between 1941 and 1942 being the worst year. Um, 1942 was probably the worst year. And you're probably looking at about... Um, oh, or December 1941. It could be December 1941. It's a pretty bad month. Somewhere between 41 and 42. Thank you, George Newman. It's very kind of you. Samuel Thompson. Would be interesting your thoughts on the parallels and differences between Room 40 Model 1 Bletchley Park, R&R and 2 Model 2. I think Germany just didn't give a damn in both wars. I think in both wars, Germany just thought it was... Uh, the trouble is... And this is what I always worry about. You will have people who will tell you the mathematical odds. And if they, uh, if they believe they know everything, they will tell you they are 100% right and there's no way the enemy can crack you. But the trick is, you always have to remember the enemy has a vote, and it doesn't necessarily have to do with engineering. And the British did have help in both wars. In World War One, they had advantages in that, that honestly, the Swedish were very significantly pro-British, and possibly there was some signals later coming from that direction. Depends on it depends on how you read the sources, whether there was or wasn't. Uh, it's one of those iffy things which I would have to do a lot more work to be sure of if it had been happening, but I. There is a weird stuff which suggests it might have been in at least one book I've read. And in the Second World War, of course, they had the advantage of having Cambridge, Oxford, and the Polish helping them. And then, of course, there's the fact that the Royal Navy always likes to set up a code cracking thing, because they do. Um, night time productions. If the British assisted at Coral Sea Midway scenario, can the IJN even get away? Given the Brits are night flying experts, what RN aircraft would you have in the Pacific at this stage? Uh, you would probably have albacores at that stage still. And sea hurricanes? Either sea hurricanes or full Mars. That's what was available at the time. That him. Uh, sure, it depends on what point in the war. Surely the, uh, surely the Japanese did have six fleet carriers in here until midway. But the trouble is, you don't have six fleet carriers. If you think about it, you go and do Pearl Harbor, you take six of your eight carriers to Pearl Harbor. You then come back, and well, they have to be refitted and maintained. And so that's a whole time when they're not available. 
So you have six, you have these aircraft carriers on paper, but are they available? And the thing is, yes, you can have, a, but if you have to keep, try and keep all six available in case the British decide to do something, ooh, that's problematic. And then again, if the British have three or four carriers, uh, a free, let's say the British have three carriers and the US have Saratoga, Enterprise, Lexington, Yorktown, Hornet. So you suddenly have a force of from uh, the the Allies are pulling from a force of eight carriers. They can probably maintain a similar if they just decide to combine them and use a create a combined task force. They can be a very scary force for you to have to deal with because you have eight, they have eight, and you're both drawing from those. So yes, you can probably generate forces of six, but more often than not, you're going to have four. And yes, you might have more aircraft on your carrier than your air aircraft overall than the British, but uh, it, it, again, it's the British are kind of, are based around constant operation, which means the British you probably end up with a scenario rather large, like Robin and uh, like the USS Robin scenario. You probably end up with the British carriers holding all the fighters and doing the air defense, and the US carriers loading up with all the strike aircraft and just blitzing you. It would be that would be the operation they'd be doing. So you'd basically be dealing with task groups, which could be, let's say, they have two British carriers and two American carriers. You'd have two strike carriers already load up, load up with their, all their strike aircraft and go whoosh, all off, and you'd have two carriers maintaining constant caps and they're both loaded with roughly forty fighters. That's not a nice scenario for you because you've got two carriers orientated around that, both with 40, you've got 80 fighters. Imagine how many they can keep in the air at any one point. And you go, yeah, it's scary. Phil Mons, in good old time of fashion, Darren Speak, BZ for tonight's stream. Thank you. Doxon, I just realized I want a supercut of Dr. Clark talking to his uh, floppy, re uh, floppy research assistant. Uh, there is many, many discussions of me and a floppy research assistant. Uh, Dan Freeman, uh, what would, would the best what-if use of Burn be to leave it for the Germans to capture just to watch and make any German attempt to the carrier force even worse than in history? No. Burn could be far more practically used for that escort carrier role she'd have been a fine for. Could help the mid-Atlantic stuff. Um, sure, Mike. I think that what happens is that Nimitz would take the L on midway and sacrifice the po a position, temporarily crush the landing in the Aleutians, and then meet up the RN to fight the um, flowing penetration into the Coral Sea. Possibly. Darkson. I just... Yeah. Hello, Animal 1635. Man Freeman. I can definitely see a less distracted RN British Commonwealth Empire deploying for Coral Sea and Guadalcanal as these were part of the Commonwealth Empire. Yep. 42 was worse yet. It was longer. February 42 was a bad month, but I think December 41 takes the title. Mm. Sure. Also, in terms of some knock-ons, if the uh, is that if there was a big joint command with PQ uh, PRA, uh, with Somerville under him, Nimitz might have used Somerville to shield Fletcher because uh, my foreign counterpart wants him to get him king. Do you, re do you really want to deal with that headache? Uh, it would have been interesting. Uh, Nimitz and uh, Nimitz and Somerville working together would be probably formed a team kind of like Cunningham and Somerville did. And Nimitz would have probably loved having Somerville as a company. Because you think about it, there, then you could get a scenario operating where we always notice about it, we always talk about it with the US, they sort of operate with tag teams that they use. They have two fleets going forward and they do. Well, if they've got Somerville, they might end up with three fleets. And they might have a free fleet formation, which could increase the momentum of the war. With one being British led under Somerville, one task force, uh, one of those task force groups, and then Halsey and the, the Fletcher taking the others. And it's just a case of, yeah, you're going to keep it up. You're going to keep it up. Jeremy Jar if 4C had carried with it, especially two, I doubt Japan would send unescorted bombers against it. They can't not send unescorted bombers against it. They don't have fighters with the range to go where the bombers are going at this point where it is operating from. Remember, the bombers are literally flown in the day before the, the day before they uh, they launch the strike. They weren't there. The airfields weren't operational the day two day uh, two uh, two forty eight hours before the strike. 
They didn't fly the bombers in because they managed to get them all the way there. They're not, there are no fighters available to escort them. So then they're not doing a strike. Turn on. Luftwaffe here and Kriegsmarine. I suspect the Kriegsmarine had the highest percentage of deaths among all personnel. U-boats, battleships, seal. Yeah, they, they, they didn't have fun. Chevy uh, 42. To be fair, kicking off the month by getting most of your battle fleet put into repair or sunk takes some beating. Uh, it will not be in a sea hurricane. Again. Uh, it would not like to be in a sea hurricane but against zero. Not against zero, but against... Honestly, even against zeros, you could... Okay. You have to then go back to the Battle of Britain experience. And the Sea Hurricane... Yeah, not it's not going to beat the Zero in a speed fight, but... Or a speed or turning fight. But if they're doing Zoom or Boom, if they're doing something like the Fac Weave, like the Hellcats do, uh, that could be pretty scary enough for the, uh, for the Zeros. And remember again, the Royal Navy fighter direction. That would help them in that fight. And fair, but if you had a combined UK US CV fleet, wouldn't they just it would take a while for them to combine the aircraft, so it would be possibly longer term. That's what once you get once you got a full British Pacific fleet going up, that's probably what you would get combined aircraft. They would be operating the same air groups, but at the beginning, it wouldn't be. It would take time, basically. For sure, the Air Force is sometimes uses, used car engines or planes. Were there ever in a situation where they consider gas diesel boat engines? There are some engines, like the Rolls-Royce Lion, which are fitted to ships, but, uh, to boat, speedboats, cars, and aircraft. So there's a few air engines which do go across the, the full range. That's right. Poles learned the value of code breaking during the Polish Bolshevik War. Decided to run with it in, since it worked quite nicely. Imagine if they devoted so much effort to cracking the enigma. That would have been problematic. Vision. So glad you didn't become merchant banker. Yeah, it would have been boring, but oh, good lord, the money they were offering. Krejic, silly question here. Would there be any reason a nation would convert an oil tanker into a missile arsenal ship? Mm, thank you for the work to do. Uh, would there be any... I could think of a few reasons. It's quite a cheap, big hull to use, but you probably use a container ship. A container ship would probably be easier. But a, a, a missile, a, a, an oil tanker would be basically if you have nothing else available and if you think you can get away, if you were trying to do it in a way which was a, a sort of secret arsenal ship, because a container ship could be considered obvious. Whereas if you had all the piping, etc. on the deck as if it was a normal tanker, but had it so that the piping could fall back, kind of like the Star Wars Venator's um, doors on their on their hangar, either you know, up to the side or just slide over, uh, pop up and slide over, and then there's VLS underneath. Yeah, you could probably use a justify an oil tanker, but that would be a lot of missiles. Uh, sometimes in the US NRN combined TV center, half the air launch torpedoes would automatically work instead of almost zero. That is the other advantage. Uh, turning to the longer, the Kido Batai was in continued operations right into midway. Darwin in the ocean age, so uh, there's simply no time for refits. Yes, but they don't always have six aircraft. Uh, they don't always have all six carriers on patrol. In fact, I think the sea, uh, the Indian Ocean raid is four. So yeah, they did have some refits and some operations going on, Trent. It's not what you would call the full refit because you're probably thinking of massive dock time, etc. But actually. Uh, what I'm talking about is the quick refit where they take them in and they basically uh, destore, paint, quickly check the ship over, work it up, and then restore it out to sea. But that still takes weeks, if not months. Nice again. How does this affect UK finances if Italy and Germany are basically knocked out of the war? Um, that's quite nice. It reduces the cost of the war effort a bit. Chevy 42. We are talking about concentrated forces, and even you have to admit the six Japanese CVs plus CVLs will be a familiar force to the Alice of the Lord. Oh, I do. But the point is, they would be a formidable force, but it's a case of 
you're suddenly presenting the Japanese with a far more difficult problem to deal with. Because instead of basically one direction of attack, they could be dealing with two. And they, where's that fleet operating from? What's it bringing with it? It becomes far more complicated. And especially if you're dealing with the RN at the point in... 1942 for 1941-42, where they are very confident in night attacks and very happy to deal the, with the risk justifying the reward, you could be dealing with a different scenario because again, the Japanese a night for a night flying is a night air defense is never that good. They don't really get uh, they have a lot of theoretical capabilities, but it never really works out. They night flying is a something which requires a lot of training and the trouble is the Japanese are not very good at A preserving their veteran crews and B passing on training experience and operational experience to build up the night flying capabilities. For example, let's see what convinced the axis to keep fighting in the end? Well, dictators who just kept going. Andrew Cummins, I received your book. I only managed to read the first chapter so far, but I'm enjoying immensely. Need something to cheer me up? Just currently working low hours. Well, I'm glad it's cheering you up, and I'm glad you're enjoying it. Also, look for a look out for the bit on Andrew Henderson in there. I'm sure, like, also Cunningham probably ended up doing something out Far East. Uh, I think he probably still ends up going back to fir become first Sea Lord. Apparently, A6M has had a radius action of 1,100 kilometers. G4M had a, uh, another 250 kilometers beyond that. True, but they didn't have them where they were needed to escort the bombers uh, when Force Z is hit. This is the point. You only have so many aircraft to go round. You can't magically click your fingers and go, we're going to have more aircraft. And yes, I know I'm, in this scenario we're talking about the RN having two carriers not sunk. But that's different from saying they built more, two more carriers. That's saying they just haven't been stupid with two carriers. Because let's be honest, both are lost through stupidity. And as I point out, knock-on effects, the RN could have had a third carrier still available. They could have had Ark Royals still in the service. Show me what to do. If both the RN and the USN can concentrate on the IJN because the RN were defeated, Rage and Marina were defeated, then the IJN has big problems. And that's the other thing. Because if Toronto's happened, then who knows what's coming that way. You know, probably if you've taken out Sean Austin Eisenhower, then you're probably going to leave, you're probably going to leave what to, uh, to do North Atlantic convoys? Do you want King George V? Possibly. But that means you probably are taking the Queen Elizabeth's you're probably taking nail rods and maybe some of the King George V's, maybe not, out to the Far East. You are probably taking whatever battle cruisers you have out to the Far East. So that's the RN's capital ship fleet. In carrier terms, well, if they've got uh, Malta protected and uh, they don't, the, the, the convoys to Malta are being made easy, uh, are sort of easier because they've got the North, they've got the North African coast. And they're not having to worry about that. Then they don't need the carriers for that operation. They need some carriers for supporting these operations. But that's probably furious and courageous would take care of most of the needs in the North Atlantic. So the odds are you have most of any armored carriers available. Most of uh, Ark Royal, if she's still afloat, glorious in the in the, this eastern fleet. In which case, you could be looking at quite a big navy. You could be even looking, talking about HMS Unicorn could be out there by this point. Not long after. That's, that's a big thing. You've probably got Victorious. You probably have Formidable. You have probably Illustrious. Maybe Indomitable. So you could have four armored carriers. You could, if everything's worked out, this is, everything's worked out. You could have Arc Royal, four armored carriers, and Glorious. Sitting out there in the RN task group. And that's the task of the RN Eastern Fleet. And that's suddenly quite a. Uh, if you've got HMS Unicorn as well, ouch. If the forces freed up from North Africa have meant that Malaya hasn't been lost and turned into a quagmire, 
there then they could still be operating from singapore in which case you have a very big problem if you're the japanese in car see hurricanes were not converted from best hurricanes around especially not the first batch no Americans, the ideal scenario where most of the German Italian units and all, all their heavy units are neutralized by the time the Pacific opens up. Then, assuming you have a, you can spare a number of town class cruisers, how would you deploy them in the Pacific? Merchant raiders, purely escorts. Oh, merchant raiders and scouts doing a lot of nasty jobs. Well, um, basically, I would be deploying them to try and make the Japanese have to split up their forces. I'd be doing everything I can to force the Japanese to have to break their forces up so I could concentrate mine against their smaller forces. Annual 16365, as I pointed out earlier, you said if there was a combined British American fleet in Pacific, wouldn't the British fleet use predominantly American naval planes? By 1944, probably. Or possibly. But by 19, 1941, no, because they'd be still be using British planes. In 1942, 43, there could be a transition. It also depend on whether the British preferred their aircraft and they could produce their aircraft. Seneca, what's the best individual carrier of World War II? Ooh. My favorite's probably indefatigable, but that's because she's probably the biggest armored carrier which comes into in, in, indefatigable and implacable because they're the, probably the biggest armored carriers that come into service. And I think she, before you get them into ways on a Malta's, that's probably the best ship you do, your ship you're designing for war service. But I I, I wish they got them into service earlier. Yeah, the Russians marketed container-mounted caliber missiles. Yes, they did. Malt well, 92. Singapore needs to leave radar and comms to work properly. Yes, but... Again, on the radar front, if you've got North Africa dealt with earlier, you're probably moving more ships to Singapore earlier. So that means you're probably moving stuff in 1941. Think of the radar sets and think of the things sent to North Africa. Imagine some of those resources being sent to Singapore instead. Sam Thompson, Carrier provides CAT for Prince of Wales and Repulse and in many subsequent operations. Are in airstrikes on Dutch oil fields in 1942 instead of 1944? More than likely. Madam if this scenario we've laid out thus far happens, how much better would be if Roger Keyes, the British commander, out there? I believe that was your pick for Malaya, right? If Keyes has been sent out as the, as the commander in chief, Far East. And then Somerville's his fleet commander. And he's got Montgomery as his land forces commander. And I don't know, whoever as his air forces commander, possibly Dowding. Then you are dealing with a very, very scary, a scary British force presence. And a quite good, quite a good command presence. Because the thing is, you've got someone who's very good at adept at dealing with the politicians. Not necessarily the best strategic thinker, but definitely smart enough to be able to listen to advice. And good enough of the PR that he can match MacArthur. And that's the other scenario, because if you have a significant British enough presence, think about this from Roosevelt's perspective, he could get rid of MacArthur. Because he could say, well, we're taking this area as the American commander-in-chief, but as the British are leading the fight in Malaya and have troops in this area and that area, yes, we are now, we are now giving it to... 
we're now putting the American forces under keys and make MacArthur be under keys. <laughs> come on. I'm, there are going to be several people going to come and, oh, no, Roosevelt wouldn't want to. Uh, no. no, no, no. MacArthur. This is the thing. No, no. This is the thing. If Roosevelt could have found a way to give, make MacArthur a less annoying person and not have to deal with him, he would have done. Although Monty and Keys would have been personality crash. Yeah, but the thing is, they'd have had MacArthur as their common enemy. That would have kept them be that would have kept them quite happy for a while. Jeffy, for uh, Dr. Clark, out of curiosity, Fusoni and Mishiro versus any two R class of your choice. Well, if it's Royal Oak and Royal Sovereign. Then the after after the fight's over, Royal Oak's the only one still left to float. But it comes close. I found, but if Indonesian oil fields are the real strategic prize for Japan, then wouldn't the main fight have been around Singapore, South China Sea, and not northeast of Australia anyway? Potentially. Potentially that would have been the massive area of fight. Oh wow, the thought of Ducky MacArthur, Douglas MacArthur being under something like Keys would be hilarious. <laughs> That's what I was asking. The result would do it. Truman, most suddenly, yes. He would. <laughs> <laughs> Grand Duke of Mechel's Shrine. Hello, I haven't seen you in a while. Uh, Nimitz would tearfully just look at them and say, thank you. <laughs> Nimitz would send them a bottle of champagne. <laughs> Possibly a bottle of whiskey and gone, good luck, God bless you. <laughs> oh. Like to go, how does the Spearfish stack up against the Avenger? <sighs> You keep talking about, I think in a nice way the Barracuda would probably been in service earlier before the Spearfish. Um, and that's the equivalent of the Avenger, not the Spearfish. The Barracuda. And it's a fair decent aircraft. Well, that's the thing, because here's the scenario that would happen. If you t if Keyes is in charge, and technically Ground Forces Commander, let's say, is MacArthur, and then he finds, you're in bed, you're not out working, you're hiding in your office. By the way, here is a guy called Montgomery. He's now in charge of you. Enjoy. At which point it becomes Montgomery can either complain about Keys uh, or MacArthur. In which case he probably spends most of his time going, "Why am I being lumbered with you? Where is the brilliant pattern? Where is any of the decent American generals? <laughs> Why have I got you?" <laughs> because let, look, MacArthur is actually, for all his points, does have some good good, good merits. But the thing is. He is not going to enjoy being in a joint command structure where he's not the commanding officer. Take care, John Shay. Um, second point, was Australia at real risk of being cut off? The big cities and ports are all along the south coast. The Zealand logistics miles from. Mm, yes and no. Um, I would say. Uh, Shumak, also, you have an excuse not to make him a car for a five-star. No, because, of course, he'll be underneath the command of a five-star, who is an admiral of the fleet. Because that's what Keyes would have been. Because Keyes was an admiral of the fleet, I think, at that point. A former commander of combined operations, five-star. Uh, he wouldn't want a five-star junior to him. So, yeah, MacArthur doesn't get five star, a fifth-star. Um, some sort of answer that one. Um, what's Australia and your risk of answer that one? Yes. 
Um, Shuppy42, I think the Americans might enjoy the idea of MacArthur being someone else's problem for a while. I think there are many MacArthur, uh, and many American commanders who would enjoy that. Uh, Darius Johnson MacArthur was an imbecile, but he gets a message that Hawaii is on attack and doesn't set highest defense alert. Uh, that was in Consens understanding. Well, that's the kind of stupid, uh, strange thing, because actually, here's the thing. Most of the pre-war doctrine presumed that Philippines was going to be attacked first. And so when you hear Hawaii is under attack, you've sort of, you've got to think, well, hang on, either the Japanese aren't bothering about us, or they are going to be hitting us next. Let's go to alert. MacArthur would have done better on the keys than slim on the mountain. Um, potentially, but keys is pretty good at the politics. MacArthur would think he was making a big dash and then would find himself outfoxed. Completely. How much does this improve post-World War II Australian-British relations? If not mistaken, the real-life events in Malaya pushed them closer towards the Americans as a consensus. Probably quite a lot, but their relationship isn't that bad post-World War II. George Newman, MacArthur has his good points, but his staff and his loyalty are not one of them. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Monty, can I make you have an accident and replace you with Wainwright? Uh, yeah, that, that, we, we could always be worried about Monty and getting people to have accidents. Hmm. Frank Swanner, Dr. C, what Admiral Generals would you rather have the public know better than place the ones they do? I'd like to know the real pattern better than the image of him, because I think the real man is slightly more, is a lot more complicated and a lot better. I like them to have a better understanding of Halsey and Nimitz, and that's the American ones. On the British ones, I wish they knew both Cunninghams, because I think John Cunningham is a, is a bit of a forgotten soul, and I would like them to have more of a knowledge of Vian. O'Connor for the generals, definitely, but there's a few other good ones as well who get forgotten. There are lots of officers. Uh, World War Two is often comes down to about a dozen names, and really, there's a there's a whole plethora beyond that. That's the thing. It could well have been described as. Um, Uh, John South, to describe Keyes as pretty good at politics as an honest statement, he was a serving MP and <coughs> did bring down the Chamberlain's government. Yes, well, you know. <sighs> there is... Um, <clears throat> yeah, he has skills in political arena. Uh, that would probably be an interesting conversation between him and MacArthur. He would probably go, unlike you, I have been an elected official. <sighs> Franklin, yes, I do agree he got Philippines over Samosa, and I do agree. But there again, he was against Nimitz, who was not as good at politics as uh, he was. Whereas Keyes was a lot better at politics than MacArthur was. I didn't say Henderson because, remember, he dies at the beginning of World War Two. so Henderson I just like more people to know about because of his role. And there again, if we go into the interwar with admirals, we've got to give the Admiral Black House and all sorts of admirals. Tom, sort of, sort of, GR3, yes, um, the book Admirals and Generals by Walter R. Bowman is definitely good. Right then, 
I am getting reminded by something fluffy, etc., that he's supposed to be going in to say hello to everyone and get uh, get to his um Betty buys. So I'm gonna do till another roughly another ten minutes. So I'll finish off the questions and make sure everyone's I've answered everyone, but there'll be about another ten minutes. So I'll be about it'll be about ten o'clock when I go. Okay, in UK time. Are you enjoying yourself? You haven't eaten all your dinner. Are you gonna eat any of the rest? No, you're gonna snack on it through night. <coughs> I shake it about a bit, more chickens become visible. Well that would get you up. <coughs> Drunk Lincoln, Dr. McClark, Mac was up against Nimitz King and Lehi, and who won? Well the thing is, yes, but again you are putting uh, you are saying three officers who are fairly good at politics by US navy standards versus uh, in uh, versus an officer who's very good by US army standards uh, against an uh, and you're then matching it up against a naval officer who is incredibly good at politics by raw navy standards um I it, it, let's put it this way. I think the war would have been very different. I think honestly, MacArthur would have ended up either either would have ended up being got rid of, or would have ended up being becoming Key's ardent supporter, and they'd have become a gruesome twosome, which would have scared everyone. And probably Japan first would have been the agreement by the time they'd finished. Because Japan we can deal with by circling and bombing. We don't need to send ground troops, would have been the argument. And then we can go concentrate on Germany. FDR and MacArthur got on bad terms when uh, MacArthur was the army chief of staff in 1933 uh, to 35. And they were arguing over FDR cutting the water pump budget to fund New Deal. Hmm. Agreed, Bertrand. They the Philippines was a part of national honor. Adfab, if the courageous glorious had been Hood sisters, would they have been risked in the same way and thus would they have survived? Mm, probably wouldn't have been risked in the same way as they'd have been larger and larger carriers would have probably got more protect uh, more protection. Because the thing is, if you're talking about carriers which can carry 48, well, the Royal Navy's got Illustrious, it's got Furious, it's got them, which can all carry much the same aircraft numbers. But it's only got one which can carry 60, 70 aircraft, and that's Ark Royal, and they take a lot more care of her. So if you were talking about carriers with a capacity of 60, 70, air 70 aircraft, they might well take more care of them. Random reductions. If all three Battle of the Battle Cruisers, Hood, Renown, and Repulse were around the Sun 1942. Sorry, we've created. How would you deploy them with the fleet? Well, that's the thing. If I've got them, they're my fast fleet with my carriers. They're basically my equivalent of the Congos. And honestly, they're not a nice things for Congos to come across. There's a drachism on blockading and bombing Japan, a roving battleship death squads. Mm, potentially. Take care, Sean Fing. Take care. John Saf, what if Keyes took MacArthur on his wing and taught him the true political dark arts? Then you have probably have President MacArthur instead of President Eisenhower. Because you're talking about someone who was, especially before he. Um, had the accident later in the war where he got back, he got his uh, got sort of almost brain damage. Um, you would be talking about an officer, uh, someone who was taught a lot of political dark arts. By the time uh, there is a very good scenario whereby potentially Keys could have ended up being prime minister post World War Two instead of Churchill. He could have been the one running for. Churchill's term after uh, World War Two, rather than so Labour might still would still probably been Churchill, but it could have been Keys running for Prime Minister of the UK 
instead of um, Churchill and uh, for a Churchill second term. And it could certain which could have been interesting because Keys would have stayed in power longer and probably wouldn't that you probably wouldn't have Eden come to power. So you might have a very different Suez crisis because Keys would have approached differently. So it's a it's an interesting scenario. Also, you might get a different scenario with like carrier production. And I'm watching this. Yeah, I'd basically turn Hood's deck after the funnel in the, into an AA showroom and keep it with the carriers. That probably would be what all of them would be done. <laughs> Take care, Tana Philica. Um, Sam Thompson, why not just drive along the Phil uh, Pan Am Clipper route? I think that's what the island hopping campaign was about, pretty much, anyway. Trent Klinger, the Philippines were undefendable without air and sea superiority. Just saying, I'm sure Mac uh, MacArthur was bad because he lost the undefendable, kind of misses victories like Holland's engine. I agree, but he also does go to his or he uh, Trent, but he also does go to his hotel, his uh, basically penthouse, and stays there for days at the beginning of the war. You could argue it wasn't defensible, but the fact is, the jo it's his job to try and defend it. And I would also argue that if he ordered the dispersal of aircraft and gone on to full alert at the same time as news for um, the attack on Pearl Harbor comes through, then he could have maintained quite a significant portion of his air power, which, whilst it wouldn't have made it defendable, it would have made it, it wouldn't have made it ultimately say, well, it would have taken the Japanese a lot more forces to get there. Which would have probably meant that they wouldn't have got to the, they they might not have gone on much further beyond the Philippines because they'd lost a lot they'd have had to rebuild it. Vision Singapore falls in February, the Philippines in May. Yeah. But you're not getting me standing here defending Percival either. There is no ground. There is absolutely no grounds I will defend Percival on. Because as much as he was a nice guy, he was not the personality you needed in the in the in layer. You needed someone who was going to say, "You will do this." Not well. Let's have a consensus agreement. No, you are the commander in chief. Do your job. I don't care if you're surrounded by third raters. You for forge them into at least a, a second rate team by basically making sure they do their jobs. That's it. How is it so easy to say the two courageouses? Because all you had to do was be be uh, halfway intelligent. Well, no, not even halfway intelligent. Let's see. Uh, there are German surface ships around there. Here we know we've been fighting them, so let's not send our carrier off on its own unescorted. And let's keep some aircraft in the air so it's alerted. <sighs> Amazing, we've saved it. Uh, courageous, uh, let's not use a fleet carrier for anti-submarine warfare operations. Or, alternatively, just have the torpedoes mug function as they had on Ark Royal the previous day. and the, the, A couple of days previously. It's just a case of s some sensible, logical things. As said, courageous is a product of... Uh, loss is a product of the false positives of exercises in the interwar period. And people really not thinking them through and thinking about what you're risking. And Glorious's loss is you can either blame you can blame Captain the, the Captain because he doesn't have aircraft flying as an alert as an alert system. You can blame Cork and Ori because he doesn't actually form it in a proper task group. So it's your choice what you can who you blame hold most most responsible. I would argue Cork and Ori should have formed them up on Cunningham. Cunningham would have been in charge, in which case there would have been aircraft flying, in which case it would never have happened. So I would blame Cork and Ori before I blame the captain. I'd blame the captain because once he's on his own, it's his responsibility, and he's the senior officer. He should have the aircraft up in the frickin' air. Next Q and A is the uh, next um, so, uh, next Q and A. If we go back to here, the videos we've got coming up. We have on the well, we did that one. Twelfth of December, the Pearl uh, uh, Pearl Harbor. Uh, uh, no, twelfth of December coming up on the twelfth Sunday. 
because I've been people asking for it, there's going to be a live discussion of the Pearl Harbor Kante Kesson doctrine. Uh, 6th of December, it's Patreon 40. It's Carl Henshaw's um, How Was British Night Fighting Doctrine and then practice, uh, developed in the four and then practiced during World War II. Uh, 23rd of December, uh, then 19th of December, it's Brewship 64, which is just going to be a standard book review stuff. Uh, 23rd of December, Patreon 41, Wayne Borean's Strategic and Tactical Thinking of RN Submarines and RN Submarine Forces Between Worlds. 26th of December, we have brew ships, a special questions. What is till the brew runs out? That's as long as my family don't object to me coming in here on Boxing Day. And 30th of December, YouTube test the Poronga vote. Uh, well, I'm watching the comments, and basically on the 23rd of December, I'm going to look at the voting results and tell you what the 30th of December, i.e. the week after, is going to be. Right. Thank you very much, everyone. Take care, Rick Vassar. Sheppy 42. Ha, Pyramid of Keys and President Douglas MacArthur. That'd be funny. It would be. The British Empire didn't cover itself for glory in the same period. Um, Jonathan's, what would Fisher have been like as PM? Oh, good lord. Um, slightly more interesting, but um, it could have been interesting when he got there. If he got there prior to World War One, that would have been quite disturbing for many people. Especially in Germany. Uh, Benjamin, MacArthur was the advisor of the Philippines government. He had dual loyalties. Mm. Second, was there ever a refit that made a ship worse? <laughs> You've seen some of the pictures of HMS Furious going through her changes to an aircraft carrier. There are a couple of those which I would argue made it worse. Take care, Sava. Thank you. How powerful was Fort Drum? Um, If people came with its range, it was quite effective. Sometimes Singapore was tiny. Philippines are an enormous archipelago. Not surprising Philippines could hold out much longer. Yeah. That is true, but Malaya also fell at that time. So that's the thing. Malaya, I think, is probably counts a bit more than the Philippines. Based on, uh, based on prior experience, it seems like the Far East Air Force should have been widely dispersed as it's so hard to avoid having a lot of aircraft go on the ground. Mm hmm. Dr. Clark. Far East Air Force was a bunch of paper airplanes, minus spares, cooling until working, 50 caliber machine guns. Yeah. Spare parts are always fun. Take care, DGV40. Nice to everyone. Enjoy the Abbey Dabby race on the weekend, Night 681. But I hope you're watching me as well. Trent Glenker, take care. Take care. Vision was officially head of Philippines Army and answerable to civilians in Manila. Ooch. Nighthound Productions. Night night. Take care. George Newman, thank you. Good night. The Shrike, take care, everyone. All Alpha Road, thank you. Take care. John Evans, thank you. Uh, Bijan, thank you. Frank Spano, thank you. Carl Gasberg, Sean Mack, thank you. Uh, take care, Carl Gasberg. Thank you, Steffi is 42. Thank you, Jonathan Burrow. Thank you, Craig H. Thank you, Dan Freeman, for and Sean Mack for doing your admin duties. You've made the chat a lot easier for me to deal with. Thank you, everyone, for watching. Uh, thank you, 9631. Thank you, Melanie6040. Thank you, Abzaski. Thank you, Greg Salski. Thank you, Samuel Thompson. And thank you, Amanda Robbins. Thank you. And thank you, everyone. Nice to What horsepower engines would you have given Hood in her 1942 refit? Enough to maintain her speed, but probably not so much that I couldn't up her armor a bit. Take care.